Good afternoon. I am Council Member Yvette Alexander. I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee on Health. I represent Ward 7 and I also chair this committee. I'm pleased to be joined with my colleague on the committee at large council member David Grasso. Today is Friday, May 30th, approximately 12.30 p.m. and we are in room 500 of the John A. Wilson building. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss Bill 20. 572, the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2014. It was introduced by myself and council members Catania, McDuffie, Grosso, Berry, Orange, Bonds, and Chairman Mendelson. The stated purpose of Bill 572 is to establish a commission on health disparities which will examine disparities in the district, um, produce reports on their findings, and advise the Department of Health, the Council of the District of Columbia, and the Mayor on the best ways to address health disparities that exist in the district. As we are all aware, certain communities in this city face a disproportionate burden of disease, illness, and death. While the reasons for such inequities range from simple to complex, most of the inequities, diabetes, asthma, HIV, smoking cessation, I just learned hepatitis C uh, just yesterday, are completely preventable. However, these disproportionately affected communities are often facing an uphill battle in terms of limited resources, inadequate working or living conditions, and fewer opportunities to make healthy choices, as well as less favorable experiences with their health care system. It is my hope that with this legislation, the district can take a major step in decreasing easily preventable conditions, as well as increase its contribution to improving the health and well-being for its residents. Before um, I call up our witnesses, I would like to as well acknowledge my colleague, Council Member at Large, David Grasso, with any comments, opening remarks that he has. Well, thank Good you very afternoon. much, Chairwoman Alexander, and good afternoon. And thank you to all the witnesses that are here to testify on this important legislation. The District of Columbia has the seventh highest incident rate and the highest death rate from breast cancer in the United States. And although the incidence rate for breast cancer is higher for white women in this city, African American women from wards 5, 6, 7, and 8 are overrepresented among those who are dying from the disease. Even more troubling, African American women in the district are showing up for treatment with advanced breast cancer at rates that are almost double the national average. In a report published by the Center for Disease Control in 2013, it was found that D.C. residents died at a higher rate from preventable heart attacks than any other jurisdiction in the country. The CDC report found that in the district, the rate of avoidable deaths from heart disease, stroke, and hypertensive disease was 99.6% per 100,000 population. The most effective demographic was African American males, ranging in age from 65 to 74. These disparities are also found when we discuss behavioral health. A few years ago, there was only one child psychiatrist that was located east of the river. Additionally, 35% of the district's transgender population has experienced suicidal ideation, with, while 39% do not have a physician for routine health care, as reported by the DC Center for the LGBT Community. Further, 58% of the district's African-American males having sex with other males are living with HIV, which is significantly higher than the national average, which is at 29%. We cannot allow these disparities to persist in our communities. In February, the Department of Health compiled a very comprehensive community health needs assessment, the first of its kind for the district, and I want to applaud the department for their efforts in this. All district residents, regardless of race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, or gender identity, deserve access to quality physicians, screenings, and treatment. And I will continue to follow this issue very closely and I'm eager to hear today from engaged uh, witnesses in this discussion to follow. So thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Alexander. I look forward to the testimony. 
Thank you, Councilmember Grasso. And now we'll call up our first panel of public witnesses, starting with Jacqueline Bowen, District of Columbia Primary Care Association, Mr. Michael Syndrum, Guy Weston, Samuel Jordan, Mr. Jordan, the Executive Director, East of the River Community Health and Research Foundation. Deborah Frazier. Come right up, Ms. Frazier. Mr. Jordan, if you don't mind moving over one. Thank you. You can get closer. <laughs> Ms. Frazier, a member of the Ryan White Planning Council. Dr. Elmer E. Harris. I'm sorry, Dr. Elmer E. Herrera. Herrera, Herta, Huerta. <laughs> Dr. Huerta, Director of Cancer Prevention, MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Welcome. And Ms. Bowen, you may proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Alexander and Councilmember Grasso. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Bowens. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the, for the DC Primary Care Association, affectionately known as DCPCA. DCPCA works to ensure that all residents of Washington, D.C. have the ability and opportunity to lead healthier lives through increased health care coverage, expanded access, and improved quality. Our key partners in this effort include community-based safety net providers who are committed to our mission of creating a health care system that allows for everyone to be covered and everyone to be cared for. Today I'm here to enthusiastically support the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2013. The district is a national leader in health care coverage for those most in need and investing in primary care infrastructure. But if we truly want to maximize that investment and ensure that everyone has the opportunity for health, we must aggressively and comprehensively address factors that play a central role in health outcomes. The time is right to establish a commission on health disparities that can call the question, beyond health insurance, how do we ensure that all of our residents truly have a fair shot at a healthy life. Answers to that question can lead to the practice changes, behavioral changes, environmental changes, and system changes that elevate Washington, D.C. to a world-class city. Key to the success of any effort to address health disparities is a comprehensive, coordinated approach. Piecemeal efforts are unlikely to move the needle or inspire significant change. The Commission on Health Disparities can begin that discussion by identifying areas for change and setting health improvement goals. DCPCA can support this work by building capacity as a clinical data hub for district agencies and providers and identifying promoting successful practice innovations. In addition, DCPCA can identify and advocate for policy changes designed to improve health outcomes within the government and healthcare system change. The Commission legislation has the potential to transform health care in the district through a call to action on disparities. More importantly, an office on health disparities can sustain that work. This legislation will put the weight of the district government behind the efforts to eliminate disparities for all district residents and address the issue of lowered life expectancy for residents in high-risk communities. We are pleased to see that the Commission, and hopefully Office, will consider the social determinants of health. Where we live, how we live, what we look like, what language we speak, and who we love are all key to the equation in a person's overall wellness. Our community health center members are engaged in efforts to address racial, economic, and social factors with strong relationships to health disparities. They see firsthand how their efforts on care integration and the treatment of whole person approaches can impact health outcomes. These innovations and collaborations must be amplified and broadly supported. In DCPCA's testimony during budget and oversight hearings, we asked this committee to, for, to help support an overall assessment of our health care capacity that can help better inform decisions for the Department of Health and district government generally. For far too long, the district has functioned without a comprehensive roadmap to guide policy. The question of whether all district residents in all our neighborhoods have equal access and opportunity for quality primary care lingers. 
DCPCA's vision is 100% quality health care with zero disparities for all. We feel that this legislation will go a long way towards realizing our vision for the district. We fully support the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act and would offer our collective expertise in the areas of primary care, public health, and data collection and analysis to facilitate its successful implementation. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on this important issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to reserve all questions <coughs> until the entire panel testifies. Good afternoon. And good afternoon to you, and thank you. I'm Samuel Jordan, a resident of Ward 7 and a multi-year active community health advocate. This hearing provides an opportunity not only to support the passage of B-2572, the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2013, but also to introduce the conversion of Healthcare Now, a long-term community health advocacy organization, into the East of the River Community Health and Research Foundation. Healthcare Now has led the fight to reform the district statutes regarding uncompensated care and the successful campaign to prevent Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield from converting from a nonprofit to for profit status when such conversion would have left at least 14,000 to 19,000 district residents without health care insurance coverage. Such active advocacy and impact will be pursued by the East of the River Community Health and Research Foundation with special emphasis on the coordinated on the coordination among district agencies and health sector organizations to address the challenge of health disparities that characterize the district's health status indicators. From 2009 to 2011, while chairman of the United Medical Center Foundation, I served as a project manager of the district's chronic care initiative, a $5.6 million collaboration between the district's health sector and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. The initiative demonstrated a variety of interventions that would reduce the prevalence of chronic diseases that revealed an alarming pattern of disparate health care outcomes across the city. The varying health outcomes exhibited by communities in the district separated by geography, income, race and ethnicity, access to health care services, health literacy, education, employment, and environmental issues are well documented. Yet these disparities underscored our conclusion that while the district presents dramatic differences in life expectancy when communities are compared, an 8 to 11 year difference when comparing far northeast at Benning and East Capital where I reside to the Foxhall community in northwest DC. Nevertheless, we are sometimes getting a few things right. This duality is the central challenge to a commission on health disparities. We have significant irrefutable healthcare disparities among our communities. At the same time, we have a record of producing results when our health sector is united with a common vision to achieve results. As the Office of Women's Health of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services reported in its chart book on health disparities by state, and I quote, residents in D.C. have among the highest rates of death due to diabetes, heart disease, and colorectal cancer in the nation. These rates are notably higher for the district's black population as com compared to the white population. Risk factors associated with these diseases, high blood pressure, physical inactivity, and obesity, occur at rates that are approximately two, three, and four times higher, respectively, for the city's black population as compared with the white population. D.C. ranks best in the nation for the highest percent of residents who eat five or more fruits and vegetables a day. D.C. also ranks among states with the best record across the presented measures of preventive care. It leads the nation in percentage of those who have had a recent cholesterol screening and ranks among states with the highest percentages of residents having a recent routine checkup. Rates of health insurance coverage among residents age 18 to 64 are among the best in the nation as well. Our new foundation should be considered one of the Commission's most dedicated community partners. We urge this committee to consider the following matters among the responsibilities of the Commission. One, the district's health sector, public and private, must develop a district-wide strategy to address health disparities by selecting a few health status indicators for improvement and a few chronic illnesses for targeted numerical reduction. Everything cannot be done at once. Progress can be best achieved when concentration of planning and resource allocation with concentration of planning and resource allocation on a few moving targets instead of all disparities. 
the Commission would monitor this collaboration and report its progress in public updates. Two, the district is still in need of a strategic general community health status assessment. We have uncoordinated status studies of various communities that leave us with a general district-wide or without a general district-wide set of concrete goals and targets. The Commission will promote the development of this common strategy. Three, the Commission must engage community organizations, residents, and advocates in a way we have not done before. Currently, there is no pattern to such engagement, and communities remain passive instead of energized partners in the campaign to reduce health disparities. Four, health disparity data collection should be a paramount charge of the Commission. Universities, the health sector, local and national, and outside consultants have produced voluminous data charts. They are not easily collated and sometimes present contradictory findings. The Commission can provide an authoritative directory of studies and research on disparities while producing periodic community-friendly reports and progress bulletins. And finally, five, the Commission can request or commission studies and research on disparity topics from the health and academic sectors that will improve our pursuit of a disparity reduction strategy. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Deborah Frazier, and I come here to represent uh, the population of the District of Columbia. I'm a longtime D.C. resident and 15 years or more in um, activism and community organizing in health. Um, housing and HIV. I am currently serving my Ted second term on the Ryan White Planning Council, which helps to determine where resources are spent in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia on supportive services for the HIV and AIDS population. I'll begin by saying, please, please, not another commission where people will make recommendations and build reputations. 160 boards and commissions in the District of Columbia and who's effective. We have already, <clears throat> in five minutes in this hearing, talked about what the health disparities are. We have the data, we have the information, we know what the disparities are, we know the populations that they affect. So to create another commission that, to create a commission that's gonna examine disparities, report on findings, and find ways to address them, that's already been done. If this commission is going to be effective, it would be more useful to have on it representatives of humans who are impacted on these diseases. Have on this commission people who are living with HIV, seniors, um, low-income populations, because there should be nothing for us without us. We are the experts on our health care. We are the experts on what's not happening. We are the experts on how we do things and how to get things done. As we talk about health disparities, we talked about some, some of my colleagues here talked about um, the challenges and the reasons why. When we talk about, be, about changing behavior, which we find in HIV and other disease modalities, how does that work? That happens from peer-to-peer -peer engagement and human-to-human -human interaction. I'm not, my doctor may tell me to come and get tests. I'm not going. If my neighbor or my friend or my colleague says, come go with me or you need to go, I'm more likely to go. How do we affect behavioral change is peer-to-peer -peer work, having people talk to each other and engage each other around what their health issues are. We talked a little bit about what the social and economic disparities are. Let us also note that there are structural challenges, meaning there are health deserts in Ward 7 and 8 and Ward 6 where affordable fresh food is non-existent, where people get their food from corner stores and it's mostly junk food and it's high price. How do people access that? How do we build and create more healthy alternatives to food and more, um, more access to that area? Let us create a commission that's actually going to do something. We don't need another study. We don't need no, some more talking heads. We don't need other people to uh, impose solutions on our communities. We have been studied and, and probed and prodded and infinitum. So I, I submit that to make the commi this committee effective, you need to engage the people that are already there. How would you do that? Some, some things have been visions about community uh, organization and things create something care coordinators or or networkers.
people who are community leaders, either from civic associations, your neighborhood watch, everybody has somebody in their neighborhood who that's Miss So-and-so. She knows the energy. She knows where you go to get things done. Engage grassroots people who have been doing a community organizing or activism or civic research and who are long-term disease survivors. Do not engage talking heads in another commission to create a report that's going to sit on somebody's desk and not get things done. If this commission is really going to be serious about addressing health disparities, involve the people who are experiencing disparities on real-life solutions. Um, I submit finally, again, nothing for us without us. I would say for a moment that some of the very agencies we're talking about are contributing factors to health disparities. Senior nutrition and senior programs and senior meals often include high cholesterol, high fat, starchy and fried food. Um, uh, why are there vending machines in, uh, with junk food in public schools? Why are there such things in D.C. Uh, government organizations? We have the tools to do the solutions. We know what's the problem. Let's address the solution with the people it's impacted on. I'll say one thing about community involvement and participation. On the Ryan White Planning Council, we have many committees, and we're charged very seriously with helping keep people who are HIV positive alive and getting people tested. One of our major, major contributing factors on what's happening on the street is our Consumer Access Committee. We learn from people who are out there getting food banks, who can't, food uh, supplies, who cannot access their doctors, who are being turned away because they're transgender or something else. So from the Consumer Access Committee, for example, we learned that many of the food banks have canned foods, which is high sodium content, less than fresh foods coming to the end. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. If you could wrap things that. up. So how do we address that? Get consumer input. Nothing for us without us. No more talking heads. Let's do solutions to our issues and involve the people who are impacted there on. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Alexander and members of the Committee on Health. My name is Dr. Elmer Huerta. I'm the former national president of the American Cancer Society and director of the Cancer Prevention Program at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Thank you. And, and for you, too, if I could get everyone's written testimony, if you have copies, I would yes, appreciate it. Yes, I do have copies. Mr. Here. King, <coughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Medistar Health, I want to express our strong support for the legislation before you to establish a Commission on Health Disparities in the District of Columbia. As you know, Medistar Health is one of the region's largest healthcare providers. We have 10 hospitals, close to 30,000 associates, and 6,000 affiliated physicians. Medistar Health is one of the largest graduate medical education programs in the country, training almost 1,100 medical residents every year. And more recently, it has contracted with the district to become one of the three Medicaid managed care organizations. Today, we serve almost 40,000 Medicaid enrollees in the District of Columbia. I mentioned these statistics to emphasize that as a large healthcare organization with many access points, we see firsthand the health disparities in the populations we serve. We know that the residents, the residents of DC have the highest rates of death due to diabetes, heart disease, and colorectal cancer in the nation. And we know that these rates are notably higher for the African American population. Risk factors associated with these diseases, high blood pressure, physical inactivity and obesity occur at rates that are two, three, and four times higher, respectively, for the city's black population as compared with the white population. These are daunting and unacceptable statistics. Let me share something I've been working on lately. I've been particularly focused on its find, um, uh, the find, uh, my area of interest lately has been finding out why African-American women living in the District of Columbia are showing up for treatment with advanced breast cancer at rates that are almost double the national average. This, despite the fact that 97% of these patients have health insurance coverage at the time of diagnosis. It was, 
I was fortunate to have recently been awarded a grant from the Avon Foundation to begin an outreach program to educate women about mammograms and explore some of the reasons for this new kind of disparity. People with health insurance going late to the hospital with a preventable condition. We have made the same observation for colorectal cancer. Hundreds of men and women in the District of Columbia are being diagnosed with this preventable form of cancer at an advanced and incurable stage. And again, almost every person has a health insurance card in their pockets. These observations show us that having an insurance card is not enough to correct a health disparity, and that in addition to our efforts to provide health insurance coverage for the population, we need to educate the community in how to use their coverage. But this is just one example of health disparities in our community. Having a commission dedicated to developing a formal city action plan will leverage the work many of us are currently doing in isolation or on a projected specific basis. Bringing, bringing focus, coordination, data, and dedicated resources to comprehensively address issues of health disparities will bring the synergies necessary to make real progress. For these reasons, MedStar Health strongly encourages the Council to enact this legislation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide my testimony. Uh, thank you all for your testimony, and I will allow um, because I have a lot of questions, so I want to make sure enough time, 10 minutes um, for questions for each member. Um, all of you have mentioned about the, the number of insured individuals in the District of Columbia. So it's not a question of not having coverage um, to, to go to your doctor's appointments. So I just want to ask you all, with, <clears throat> we, with a, such a large percentage of insured individuals, what, what's going on with people being diagnosed at such late stages? Um, when you have insurance, you can go to the doctor. And I'm talking across the board, not only uh, across all income levels, across all <coughs> levels of education. What is it? What, what will it take for people to get to the doctor? If I may, um, let me share also another uh, experience I have had at the Washington Cancer Institute where I worked for the last 20 years. And I just gave this presentation at the National Cancer Institute called Two Sides of the Coin at the Washington Cancer Institute. One side of the coin is the just I just related to you, people with health insurance going late with a preventable condition. For the last 20 years, I've been having radio programs and television programs on a daily basis for the Latino community in this metropolitan area. And over the last 20 years, I've been able to attract over 30,000 people, Latinos who are poor, uneducated, recent immigrants, undocumented, without health insurance, to go without symptoms to see me at the hospital to this cancer prevention clinic. So what is the difference? Education, education, education that can be done through many different ways. The lady next to me, she just mentioned something extremely important. Peer-to-peer -peer is one tool to use it. In my case, it was the radio, it was the television on a daily basis for 24 years. That allowed these people who are completely vulnerable to put their hands into their pockets and pay precious money, which is for them important for a consultation which is just in prevention. That demonstrates that the need of education in the community is extremely important. Council Member. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm I would add that while it's true that we have a high rate of insurance coverage, those rates don't translate directly to utilization across the city in many of our communities. Although registered or enrolled in DC, uh, Healthcare Alliance, Medicaid, Medicare, we're at the same time under utilizers of those services. So it suggests that there are many other factors, not simply one or two, many other and sociological factors as well as income, access, transportation, employment, health literacy, education, that impact the utilization of the services that might be available. And what Thank we're hoping... And, and not even that, but even for people 
who are working and educated, time is a factor too. And until we really break down and, and feel symptoms and get sick, we don't slow down. So I think that all of us are a victim of that. Certainly, and the commission and gives you, excuse me, the commission gives, you, gives us, the city, an opportunity to actually raise the profile mm -hmm. of this matter of disparities. So, of, I'm, I'm sorry, and I, I have another point for you. I know my time is limited, but, and we can always talk after the hearing, too. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, maybe we need to give incentive, or, or maybe we need to address that with providers and with insurance companies as well. Maybe, you know, they need to play their role in getting their members to the doctor. They need to all the MCOs, um, Medicaid managed care, commercial insurance providers, get your insured members to the doctor. Get them to the doctor. Um, maybe a lot of insurance companies will find out when they go to the doctor, then, you know, they're going to have to end up paying and, and for Council, something. Councilman but get them to I was the just doctor. A I'm sorry to interrupt. I would just add to what the other panelists said. I also think it is the, the language that we speak and really, uh, you know, it's education and really taking advantage of and respecting the community for what they know and really going to them and helping them understand what they need. So I think it is the engagement of the providers, it's the barriers within the system that sometimes cause problems, but also really reaching out into the community and using community health workers and others to work to really kind of change a legacy of this is what my mom did, so this is what I do. So how do we really begin to start that education and change a legacy of behavior? So. Thank you. I'm, and Ms. Frazier, I just okay. wanted to mention for you, I am going to take heed to your suggestion. Um, the composition of this commission um, does comprise of nine members from the experts in the field of health disparities, uh, social and human services, early learning and education, minority communities, economic development, and ecology and environment. I will take heed to um, your recommendation that there do there there needs to be an addition of community members on that commission. So I will um, take a serious look at that and consider to add some community members to the commission. So I do thank you um, for that suggestion. Just ma'am, ma'am. One, well, one thing that I need to submit. Well, is I that? have a couple of things, okay, and then okay. if I have time, you can add okay. that. I have a couple of things that I wanted to add to that. Um, in addition, all of you, I'm concerned, you mentioned uh, the need for a health um, needs assessment, a health status assessment. I just wanted to make you all aware, and I am concerned, because Department of Health um, last year has come out with a community needs assessment. And I'm concerned that I don't think a lot of people are aware of this. And I think it's important for the Department of Health to actually disseminate this to all of the, you know, to all of the witnesses today. I will definitely disseminate this, but this is important. And this would be the foundation that I would <coughs> hope uh, the commission would then act on that and, and recommend, you know, policy and things that need to be done to address this. This report in itself is nothing unless we act on this assessment. But I just wanted to make you all aware that this does exist, and I'm concerned. Um, I just want to ask you, were you all aware that this existed? Councilman Brett, I'm aware that it exists, but I was making a distinction in my own remarks between the existence of the assessment and what is called, or what could be called, a strategic community health needs assessment. That is, we have had studies, for example, uh, Huron at United Medical Center was supposed to do a community health care assessment as its number one or first task mm -hmm. under its contract. Uh, and I attended several meetings held by Huron in the community, and they sort of epitomize the kind of this problems we have with the so-called health care needs assessment. First, the universe of respondents was much too small. Uh, we need, if we're going to have a citywide community health care needs assessment for the city, we probably need a universal respondents at least four or 5,000 persons minimum. Expensive, yes, but we need self-reporting at that scale in order to have the data on which we can build strategies for approaching, as we recommended, several uh, chronic illnesses, several 
uh, health status indicators at once, not everything at once. So there is a difference I'm drawing between a health care needs assessment and a strategic health care needs assessment. So, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, when you mentioned, um, Ms. Bowens, about building capacity for a clinical um, data hub, mm -hmm. uh, do you have that currently, and how would you build the capacity of that hub? Well, we're very excited that uh, at the Primary Care Association, uh, we actually are collecting uh, significant amounts of data, particularly around utilization through primary care. And so we actually host uh, the majority of the community health centers on one standard electronic health record. And we are actually in a position to begin to look at information exchange, to be able to look at trends and data, and actually are working with both the Department of Health and DC Healthcare Financing. Uh, and as a way to begin to connect. So we certainly have the platform and are excited about the ability to be, begin to really look at some informatics and data analysis uh, with our partners. So uh, absolutely we have the platform uh, to actually really uh, have a data warehouse of information and now is that beginning that next step of really analytics and, and informatics. And I also would just want to follow up on the issue of the assessment. Uh, so yes, we, I am aware of the Department of Health's document, but I'm also looking at health planning and how we really make decisions about where we make investments, capital investments, and so as we're looking at certificates of needs and others, we really have some direction and we're fully informed when we make those decisions. And while I believe the, the health assessment that the Department of Health has done is a good start, uh, we really do need to be doing more, particularly when we look at where we're going to put services and ensure that they're equitably distributed. Uh, thank you. Councilmember Grasso? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate your expertise on this issue. I just have a couple of thoughts. I really like the direction that this testimony went in. It's not about creating a commission. Um, this is about creating action items. This is about creating a way to stop disparities. It's, it's not just to get together and chat about it. And I might suggest, uh, Councilmember um, Alexander, that we do something similar that we did with the health insurance exchange is uh, have a regular update here at the council from this commission um, that uh, you know engages in a public way that asks for action items you know that can actually come back I think people that have uh, deadlines that are public like that tend to work a little bit more towards uh, solutions rather than just towards knowing what's going on which is valuable but I think like um, like Ms. Frazier said, this is something that we know about. We know there are disparities. We know where they are, and it's a matter of tackling them really at the root of the cause. Mm -hmm. I want to ask some, uh, one quick question um, to Dr. Huerta about his research. I, uh, I was, um, you know, had the opportunity this past weekend to watch The, the Normal Heart um, on, on TV, on HBO, and uh, it's, if you haven't seen this movie, I think it's important to watch because it, it gives you a concept of what it was like on the ground in the crisis at the beginning of the HIV crisis. And one of the things that struck me that um, kind of connected to this conversation was that folks, folks weren't dying of, of HIV uh, or of AIDS, even full-blown AIDS. They were dying earlier than that of, of um, ad, uh, outset of cancers and pneumonia and other things. And it's, it occurred to me that I wonder if there's something perhaps going on in our own city where when you hear about somebody dying of, you know, um, breast cancer with advanced stages or, you know, even colorectal cancer, where you ha when you hear that, is there some connection? Can we trace it back uh, to other causes as well, including perhaps undetected HIV? Um, and here in our city, you know, I've heard uh, anecdotally the, the, the stories of um, seniors engaging in risky sexual behavior that ends up with the spread of HIV, um, but then you may not notice the HIV or may not get documented in a way because they're dying then from advanced breast cancer or from something else. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Yes, uh, Mr. Grosso. I think the, everything goes to the point that we need to see a person in, as a whole. We don't need to see a person as a breast or as a uterus or as a bone or as a uh, HIV. No. We need to see a 
a person holistically. So if we see a person holistically, then our education approach needs to be holistic also. We need to uh, uh, educate people and talk to people to many different uh, channels. Could be peer-to-peer, -peer, which is very important. Could be through the media, which is also extremely important in our times. But we need to provide them education in all sorts of issues. In my radio shows that have been running for 25 years every day in this town for the Latino community, that's what I try to do. I try to talk to them not only about cancer, but also about washing their hands, about right. preparing their foods, about breast cancer, about anything. So if we as a city, if we as a government, if we as an organization, we can provide the communities with all sorts of a public education program, that's, I think, is going to make a difference between that because people, they will realize that there is not only one enemy they have in front of them. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Uh, yeah, but let me, I want to hear from Ms. Frazier first. She didn't get as much chance to speak before, so please. So uh, uh, I submit that there are a few things that people are not recognizing. There are community myths that say, um, uh, don't let them cut you. You're going to die from something anyway. If you go to the hospital and they cut you, they're going to find it out and, and I'm going to die. And people have stories about that. Secondly, please, people, recognize data and all that notwithstanding, Folks from the beginning have poor experiences with their health care providers off the break. Your clinic, your primary care health care provider who does not respect you, who does not take the time to listen to you, one poor experience is going to keep you from coming back to get a test, to get uh, an assessment, to use your card, or to be trained how to use your card. Card is useless to me because I'm being disrespected in the health system and I'm not going back and sometimes I'll risk my life because I don't want to do that. Again, barriers in terms of of, of access to health care. What, what are the hours for the clinic? How do I get there? I'm working in thoroughly on HIV, how that community survived, and why there's Ryan White legislation to this day is because there was peer-to-peer, human-to-human, friend-to-friend, caregiving until death, and before that time, and people were not rushing to the hospitals, there was a care system and a support system of, of friends and people that sometimes didn't even know each other. And lots of organizations that evolved, like Food and Friends, and the Planning Council and others, based on the fact that people, humans, did not need research, they did not need data, they did not need experts, they took care of each other. And that is still the bedrock of community and behavioral change. And the question is then, how do we expand that? And how do you make it work across the entire city so that we don't have these disparities? Because there's still a reality in our city, and we've had some tackling of these issues, and certainly we've expanded access to, to insurance coverage, and we've done all these things, but there's still a gap. When I you know, when I was at uh, Bread for the City volunteering last year, you know, you could see it every single day that there's an enormous gap in what we're providing. So um, I'm willing to look at it from the big picture and say, okay, we have to invest money here, here, here. We have to do this and this. But let's create a system that actually works for the people every day on the street. Um, we need to have that conversation. I think that's what the value of this commission is. Wonderful. We would love that. Okay. Did you want to add something, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Uh, with respect to uh, Normal Heart and the early days of uh, the discovery of the HIV infection. Uh, I think part, in part response to your comment, uh, there were before that date, uh, roughly dated, I think we accept 1985 as roughly the date of the first recognized uh, infection. 82. But, 82. Thank you. Uh, 81. I think the important point is that there were a number of infections uh, noted beforehand and illnesses, pneumonia you mentioned, Kaposi sarcoma. These were at that time unknown to be opportunistic infections as a result of the HIV infection when the T cell is too low. So I wanted to add that because right. it, it certainly suggests that there is a charge for this commission even to make certain that we're getting the kind of research and discussions we need among the health sector, the academic sector, and charged or commissioned by this uh, new Commission on Health Disparities to do these studies and make public reports. Well, I want to thank you all for your testimony. I look forward to continuing to work on this issue with you for years to come. Uh, thank you. While I still have um, three minutes left, I'm going to capture one more <laughs> question um, with Councilmember Grasso's time left. Uh, you all mentioned, too, I know, Doctor, you mentioned, and Mr. Jordan, that the, among the highest rates are three, um, three, um, three chronic illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, and colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Jordan, 
I am um, going to explore your idea that you think it would be good to pinpoint so that we can see measurable yes. um, results. To start off not trying to save the world, but to start off with some of these targeted chronic diseases that we can measurably see improvement. I, I do like that idea, and I'm wondering, um, and Doctor, if I can get from you, is that an overall consensus with those three targeted illnesses? Uh, would you recommend that we would work on those? And all of you, I would like your opinion, just to target, say, diabetes. And we know that that's hitting not only our adult population, but especially our younger population with diabetes. Um, what would be the disease or heart disease? What would be what we really would need to target to prevent some of the, the other diseases? Um, is it wise to target a one thing? The amazing thing is that these conditions, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease, they do share common risk factors. If we fight obesity, food, I mean, uh, uh, nutrition, exercise, etc., we can really knock out these three conditions. So I think in addition to focusing on diseases themselves, I think we need to also focus on the risk factors that cause these conditions so we can affect all of them all of them at the same time, breast cancer included. And then maybe hospitals, they have a wealth of data. The way we find what we found in the, my hospital is because I just asked the director of data to give me the list of all advanced cases of cancer that we saw over the last five years. For our surprise, a lot of them went from my neighborhood, War 5, and that's where the Avon grant is going to be about, which we are going to do to War 5, so, uh, with using geomapping, trying to localize clusters in War 5 where the actions can be taken. So I think it would be very nice if this commission asked every single hospital in this Said, listen, analyze your own data and find, take care of your own neighborhood. And, and I would just simply add uh, to, to the doctor's point about risk factors because we also have to not just look at those folks who are in care, but those folks who presented with risk factors who were not in care. So I think it's really important that looking at the risk factors allows us to re begin to uh, really um, um, attack those issues for those who are not in care because I think sometimes we lose sight of the folks who may were never really diagnosed. So I really would echo that and, and we at the at the PC in fact are really beginning some projects working in concert with the Department of Health through their Healthy Heart Initiative actually doing that that things that same thing. So I certainly concur with a focus but the risk factors may give us more of what we need versus narrowing down to the specific diseases. Uh, we can act also over the age span. Yeah. risk factor for kids, adolescents, young adults, and older people. And Thank we should you. also look at family histories. Family histories, geomapping will give us what the neighborhood challenges are, but also family histories of that, and take into account what those disease factors are. Yes, targeting three, maybe we can have some, some, some clear impacts on things and we can see early on with process evaluation what's working and what's not before we spend three years thinking about a thing and find out it's not working. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All of you would be eligible members of the commission. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> Our next panel of witnesses, I'd like to call up um, Francisco Shimeo. Uh, Senior Director, Corporate and Foundation Relations from MedStar Washington Hospital Center Foundation. Mr. Guy Weston, is Mr. Weston here? Christine Gray, Time Banks USA. Khadija Tribble, Community Wellness Collective. Gable Barmer, President of J&G Consultants. And I have one more, so I'm going to call up, because Dr. Waldo, you'll probably want to come together. So I will call up on the next panel. Um, Lisa Morrow. Oh, she, she's sitting in her testimony. She could not come today. Dr. Susan Leggett-Johnson. Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Well, let me skip over. I'll, I'll call you on the next one. Erlene Budd. I don't see Ms. Budd. Ms. Budd's in the hospital. Okay. Thank you. Lori, oh, I'm sorry. Lisa Alexander. Come right up, Ms. Alexander. Come on, cuz. <laughs> Ms. Alexander is professor and assistant dean for community-based partnerships at George Washington University. Welcome. You may begin um, with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Alexander and Council Member Grasso. Uh, my name is Francisco Samio, and besides being a native Washingtonian, born and raised, I'm the Senior Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations at the MedStar Washington Hospital Center, which is a nonprofit, 926 bed major teaching and research hospital. It is the largest private hospital in the nation's capital and among 50 of the largest hospitals in the nation. The hospital center is committed to addressing the very same topic on our agenda today as it provides care to the districts underserved. In fiscal year 13, our most recent audit fiscal year, the hospital provided 119.4 million in unsponsored care, a combination of 35.8 million in charity care and 83.6 million in bad debt. A couple of years ago, I lost a dear friend to brain cancer who came to the District of Columbia from El Salvador and was only one semester shy from graduating from the University of Maryland College Park. She was only 30 years old and was totally assimilated to our culture and had command of the English language, yet she inexcusably fell through the cracks of the system and was diagnosed at a late stage when it was too late. According to the District of Columbia Health Community's collaborative most recent community health needs assessment, many issues identified in prior assessments still persist. District residents, have among the highest rates of death due to diabetes, heart disease, and colorectal cancer in the nation. These rates are notably higher in the district's African American population as compared to the Caucasian population. Risk factors associated with these diseases, high blood pressure, physical inactivity, obesity occur at rates that are approximately two, three, and four times higher respectively for the city's black population as compared with the white population. My statistics do not even take into consideration our Latino population, which is the district's fastest growing community. Many of these residents are not documented and can significantly increase the 9% that is accounted for. Our health care services for this population is fragmented, and many who lack English speaking abilities get lost in the health care continuum, and the most ill return to their countries to die. Despite high insurance rates, Health care services are not even distributed by, evenly distributed by ward, creating significant challenges to access. There is a dire need to expand these services as well as improve care coordination between health and social services to help residents navigate the system and obtain the services they need. On behalf of my institution, I want to express our strong support for the legislation to establish a Commission on Health Disparities in the District of Columbia. Establishing a Commission on Health Disparities would bring together key stakeholders from our health professions community as well as consumers who would be able to develop an action plan and provide insight on how to better improve and integrate health services in a way that can facilitate the timely use of preventive health services by creating access points for individuals to obtain primary care. Lives are at stake and to reinforce reinforce what Ms. Fraser said earlier, we do not have time to entertain more research for the sake of just publishing. We have the research. We know the best practices. So now we need action. A commission on health disparities could be a vehicle to improve the district's health and reduce disparities by using the available resources we have and help, help people live longer lives. In closing, I would like to quote Dr. Donald Berwick, former president and CEO of the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and Administrator for CMS. The names of the patients whose lives we save can never be known. Our contribution will be what we did not what did not happen to them. And through and though they are unknown, we will know that mothers and fathers are at graduations and weddings they would have missed, and that grandchildren will know grandparents they might have never known, and holidays, excuse me, and holidays will be taken and work completed, and books read, 
and symphonies heard and gardens tended that without our work would have never been. Thank you for the opportunity to present my testimony. Thank you, and thank you for sharing your personal experience as well. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, uh, Councilwoman Alexander. Um, I'm on, right? Yes. I've never done this before. This is my first time, so. Um, my name is Christine Gray, um, Dr. Christine Gray. I um, am a senior associate of Time Banks USA and a board member of Time Banks USA. I am a proud immigrant to Washington, D.C. I've lived here since 2000. Um, I also teach systems change at the UDC School of Law. And um, what I wanted to speak to, I actually came with prepared testimony and I kind of jumped it when I was hearing all the things that you were saying. Because what has struck me over and over and over again as I've been hearing this, and, and Councilman Grosso said, let's create a system that works for all. But um, what doesn't often gets lost in the wash is the interface between system and community. And so systems drive themselves and the community is here, an informal community, and the formal dynamics of a system. And how those two intersect is incredibly important and so often gets overlooked. And it's the one thing that we look at when we do time banking, it's a crucial question that we keep looking at again and again. And when I teach systems change, as I have done at the law school, and I have also done at the um, School of Social Work in Utah, what I've noticed is that people who are involved in systems often don't take that interface question. Um, they don't explore it deeply. They don't address it powerfully. Um, I work with uh, Ms. Frazier, and we work in the community. I'm very familiar with the dynamics of peer-to-peer. -peer. I've worked in the juvenile justice system here with the Time Dollar Youth Court, which was a very powerful preventive tool for juvenile justice. Those same kinds of approaches can be used in the health system. We worked with the Alameda County Public Health Department to help it, um, work with one of the poorest communities in Oakland to actually put on their own community annual health fair. They manage it, they organize the booths, they run the, all the stuff in the process. They become educated, they form, inform each other, they create a new peer culture. It's an incredibly powerful way of building up access to the system and a partnership between the system and the community. And um, I would just urge that that be taken into account. And I would like to offer our expertise on that front. And we, we feel very passionate that this is an aspect of health that gets overlooked time and time again as people focus on systems and not on the intersection between informal and formal ways of approaching care. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chairperson Alexander, Councilman McGrasso, staff, and other members of the Health Committee. My name is Gabriel Bauman. and I serve as the president of J&G Consultants. Today I would like to share comments and recommendations for Bill 2572, the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2013. This is a unique opportunity to establish a pioneering and innovative group that can track current health disparities trends provide open and transparent data that will help with the co-creation of collaborative pro projects and a formal process wherein the Department of Health or DOH leadership can receive ongoing guidance and strategic direction regarding community needs. The proposed nine members for the Commission on Health Disparities, so CHD, body will have high level views of the vexing problems that affect residents throughout the district. Through extensive research and ongoing examinations of residents' needs relative to health disparities, the CHD will have the ability to provide recommendations to DOH regarding the best use of resources to effectively reach the vast majority of district residents. The key tenets of the CHD members are the ability to engage and a core belief that all decisions are data-driven. The CHD members must view all decisions through a broad lens that encompasses not just government leadership, but consciously seek to the input of community, faith-based, and business stakeholders as well. Inclusion of all residents and open and transparent data disbursements are essential. 
having had a cursory having had cursory interactions with several district government commissions over the past few decades, one common gap with most members that I've observed is the inability to identify, pursue, and or successfully receive federal grants. The CHD would be placed in an inventive position because of the existing relationships that that currently exists with the federal agencies the DOH has established. One recommendation is that the CHD submit a targeted fundraising goal annually to the council. This requirement should be embedded into the bill to ensure that it has teeth. For example, the CHD could seek federal funds to secure contracts to conduct focus groups, social marketing campaigns, or citywide symposiums to bring attention to chronic diseases in partnership with DOH and other key stakeholders. The activities would be performed in wards where chronic diseases are most prevalent. The proposed composition of CHD board, however, I like the proposed composition of CHD board is broad. However, I'd like to recommend that residents are included from wards that are most adversely affected by the following diseases and they're listed from the leg legislation. Chairwoman Alexander and Councilmember Grasso, to ensure that this is not just another commission that has unfilled seats and is not high performing, I would like to make the following recommendations. The CHD leadership testifies at the DC Council Committee on Health's performance and oversight hearings in partnership with DOH. The CHD is required to ensure, excuse me, secure a facilitator to ensure that all aspects of the bill are achieved during the inaugural year. An annual retreat with at least six members occurs to review the past accomplishments and prepare for the upcoming year. A firm fiscal annual target is set to ensure that the CHD is hyper-focused on securing federal funds. The CHD is given granting authority in excess of $250,000. And finally, all agendas, meeting notices, annual strategic plans, etc., are posted for public consumption. In closing, I would like to make the I would like to close by making reference to the National Social Campaign that simply says one plus one equals three. It's the teen pregnancy prevention program. It's a catchy slogan that draws a great deal of attention from observers. The National Social Campaign one plus one equals three focuses on health and wellness by encouraging safe sex and pregnancy prevention. With the creation of the CHD, my hope is that the members will devise innovative and imaginative solutions that will positively affect district residents whose lives are disrupted by chronic diseases. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'll be happy, happy to answer any questions that you may have. See, I have my um, younger committee director because I didn't get that, but I get it now. <laughs> I get it. One plus one equals three. <laughs> That's cute. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Count, uh, Alexander and Councilmember Grasso. My name is Lisa Mastone Alexander. I'm a district resident for over 30 years and a primary care provider. I practice medicine as a physician assistant. I started my career at Greater Southeast Community Hospital, saw the first case of pneumocystis in 1981. I've spent my career looking at ways to creatively address what we know as health disparities. Right now, I'm a um, director of the Physician Assistant Program and Dean for the Community-Based Partnerships at GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I come to you today with another uh, underserved community that I think bears mentioning. I would like to provide testimony to support the proposed amendment providing for the inclusion of the disability community as a category of individuals covered by the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2013. As I said, I'm a primary care provider, but I've cared for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities for the last 10 years. Along with my colleagues at Bread for the City Medical Clinic, we have designed and implemented a successful medical home primary care model that includes care coordination, continuous and comprehensive health services, and 24-7 availability to direct support professionals and nurses caring for adults in community-based residential settings. 
This program has documented significant improvement in our patients' chronic health conditions, reduced emergency room utilization, and decreased fragmentation of specialty care. We have demonstrated cost-effective strategies resulting in higher quality care for this uniquely challenging population of adults. In addition to providing clinical services and evaluating the metrics associated with the medical home program, I have also conducted numerous health reviews of individuals living in supported residential care for the Department of Disability Services. During those reviews, I noted the presence of health disparities primarily resulting from lack of access to primary and specialty health healthcare services. The cases that I reviewed revealed findings that were consistent with evidence from the medical literature as well as comprehensively researched policy reviews by the U.S. Surgeon General, the Institute of Medicine, and the National Council on Disabilities. These reports identified many root causes of health disparities in this specific population, including barriers restricting access to care, the lack of training of health professionals, and the complexity of health conditions. Through collaborative partnerships with DC Department of Disability Services, Georgetown University, and GW, we've worked vigorously over the last 10 years to ameliorate these disparities, achieving moderate incremental improvements. However, we have really only scratched the surface. For instance, despite the success of our medical home program at Bread for the City, there still remain an inadequate number and an inadequate number of primary care and specialty providers willing to care for our patients. It is for this reason that I strongly support the amendment promoting inclusion of the disability population in the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act. The increased visibility resulting from this categorical inclusion will help to shed light on the health disparities that exist and hopefully increase awareness of the needs of this highly underserved population. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony and 10 minute rounds of questions. Um, you mentioned, um, and you gave a personal story, but you mentioned uh, the Latino population and I am concerned as well about our immigrant population. Do you think a lot of our, I guess a lot of our instances of, of um, our mortality rates are increasing um, due to such a insurgence of our immigrant population as well? And what will it take um, to get them to the doctor or to make them aware of their health? I know we have the Alliance um, in the District of Columbia that will cover um, that sector of our population, but what, what more is needed? Well, actually, um, I, I'm, I'm very big, uh, even though I've been in the nonprofit sector for over 10 years, uh, I, I believe in sustainability and, and uh, you, uh, trying to figure out first how to use existing resources. Uh, and I'm actually partnering with, with Dr. Huerta, who you heard from earlier before, in reestablishing a, a Metropolitan Council on Latino Health, uh, bringing together these individuals uh, and, and seeing how we can uh, integrate uh, our efforts with the Latino Health. Uh, because the thing is that the, the, the approach in the system is very fragmented. You have uh, great institutions that work on their own, uh, but I don't think that there's communication. So kind of creating a, 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 some sort of a safety net for that population. And, and these are the people who are in the front lines, uh, we, we need to figure out what's not working. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's very important because obviously people are, are, are slipping through the cracks. But yes, we have an influx of, of more people who are coming in here who are, are, are not on the grid, if you will, if we want to use that terminology. Uh, and, and then we, we have uh, these statistics are quite alarming. Thank you. And I'm so glad, um, Ms. Alexander, that you brought up about the, because I, I really wasn't focusing on that, and it's good that you brought that to light about the physically and intellectually uh, challenged individuals, as well as mental illness. And I know that we're focusing a lot more on mental illness now, but there needs to be a crossover because a lot of persons who suffer um, from mental illness, that's a major barrier in them receiving medical care. Right. You know, and, and it's really important, and I know we're doing a lot. The council passed a unanimous resolution about dually diagnosed mm -hmm. um, persons in terms of home health care. Right. Um, but we really need to follow that through, 
you know, whatever level of care they get, and it's mm -hmm. good for um, providers to, to know um, the health history as well as the mental, the overall health history, to include the mental health history. What are some of the barriers um, for our, our physically and intellectually challenged population, especially, well, I know the physically challenged um, with some barriers they have to get to, to medical appointments, but for the intellectually challenged, um, who, you know, how do we address that? And have you addressed that in your current um, work that you do? I think there is such a demand for primary care services that this uniquely challenging population, by, by virtue of their complex health conditions, requires more time to be spent. And oftentimes, they, many times they may be nonverbal or have behavioral health issues, so it's very difficult to communicate effectively with them, so you end up having to navigate that conversation with a staff person and the level of training that that staff person has may preclude you from really addressing some of the root causes. Um, I've heard some clinic administrators um, testify that there are um, behaviors that are somewhat off-putting to other clients or other patients in the waiting rooms and so that they are reluctant to fully integrate them, even though this is outright discrimination. Um, but it does create um, uh, stigma attached to this population that it's totally unfounded. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely have to address that. When I go over the social determinants, and, and mm -hmm. they would include um, all of those factors. Right. That's why it's important um, while I'm having these hearings to know what right. the composition of the commission mm -hmm. should be and what are the key factors that they need to address as far as the social um, determinants are. And I know that um, education is one. So we could look at that in terms of any intellectual uh, disabilities. Of course, the 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 um, dis the physical challenges are, are evident, but I do want to include right. that for the intellectual intellectually challenged individuals. I have female patients that are, when we try to get breast cancer screening, it's very difficult to uh, get them to mammography, mammography services that can understand their hesitation. You know, many patients were formerly resided at Forest Haven, and we don't need to bring up that traumatic experience. But um, their inter interface with the, with the healthcare system is traumatized. So g getting them to access services, you know, you really have to deal with them in a very different way. And sometimes when you're interfacing with the healthcare system, either the equipment isn't right or the staff training isn't adequate. And so they fall through the cracks because they can't do an, a mammography because the patient doesn't cooperate or things like that. And so I guess that sounds like a lot of training on the provider and as well how to handle, mm -hmm. you know, a diverse um, population of population. patients. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Mr. Barmer, thank you for your recommendations. It seems like uh, you were all set to go with this commission uh, <laughs> with some of the added recommendations you have. And I, I do agree. Um, with um, your recommendations. You mentioned that, and I guess it is going to take some money is always involved in funding when we're putting together such a, a commission. Uh, now, you believe that with the commission, so when you say federal, or they should be um, established to be able to, um, to uh, apply for grants or federal funding, are there any commissions out there? I know that um, health disparities is a major issue, I, I would imagine, across the country. Is there federal funding available if such a commission uh, was developed in the District of Columbia? Yeah, I think that, you know, through conversations with existing partners at DOH, if such a, if such a commission was established through CDC and other federal agencies, that dollars could be made available. There are capacity building dollars and expansion and enhancement funding. It's just I think that if the commission had the authority, they wouldn't be bound by DOH to go through DOH for those dollars. 
and they can independently apply for those funds. So you're saying the commission should be independent from Department of Health? I think that for the commission to be effective, um, there has to be some lines of demarcation. Because I know when we talk about some of the chronic um, illnesses and diseases, the department already handles some of those things, and they have funding to address some of those issues. So would it be recommended that the commission also, how, how would the commission, I guess, differ from, say, for example, the Department of Health with the community needs assessment and them, you know, targeting populations that different things need to be addressed? What would be the major difference with this commission? And you all can address that. What does the commission need to do that is really going to get results um, versus what the Department of Health is already doing? What, well, what can I, they do differently? I'll speak um, through my experience since I, I've got my, my uh, first experience as a, as a healthcare professional working at DCDOH. Then I've had the privilege of working for the local medical centers, pretty much making a tour. Uh, I had two tours at GW Medical Center, one with Nova, and I'm presently at MedStar. Um, and I know there are mechanisms from the feds that actually award uh, specific grants to state health agencies, so DOH would have to be a, a pass-through. Uh, I don't know of a mechanism that would award it directly to uh, the D.C. government and then the D.C. government directly to the commission. Uh, but I think that uh, there has to be a cautionary note uh, that sometimes I, through my history I've seen uh, parties with certain agendas kind of take control of that. So we have to ensure that, that there's none of that with that and that there's accountability. Uh, and, and it was mentioned before today that, that there has to be some sort of uh, action plan and, and, and metrics and saying this is what's going to occur next week, next month, next year. Uh, and people have to be accountable to that or else, again, it's another club. It's another way of uh, even if someone's on, on, on that commission and say, well, I'm going to funnel money to myself. Obviously, that's not going to happen, but they have inf ability to influence that money goes in a certain way. It may not necessarily go to the best to the best uh, steward for that money. Uh, so I think that it's very important that the people on this commission uh, uh, are able to develop a, uh, an action plan that, that will yield uh, impact uh, as soon as possible. Again, people are dying. This is a, a dire need. It's been happening for many years. We, we've had reports. We've had Healthy People mm -hmm. 2000, Healthy People 2010. Uh, we know what the statistics are. We know, I mean, I've stopped going to certain health conferences because that's, they talk about the same thing over and over again, what the burden is, what the, what, you know, what the, what the barriers are. We know. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I think that there is, if, if such a commission were to be established, I think that there are mechanisms in place that could uh, award money directly to the state health agency, which is And really the commission can give us a straight mm -hmm. forward um, plan of action. This is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. We have the experts. This. I mean, I've worked with Dr. Alexander. I've worked with people in, in the room. So I, uh, uh, you know, I, I went into healthcare because of Dr. Huerta. I mean, uh, he was uh, a model back then. And, and sorry, uh, he was a... Uh, uh, one of my uh, role models, and I went to get my master's in public health. And so I think that we have the people of expertise uh, and collaboration can exist with, with all the stakeholders. And at the same thing, I think that the consumers would pay a, a, an important role. I've seen processes in the past. I was actually hired at DOH because DOH was unsuccessful at getting the first comprehensive control grant, grant because what they did at the time, and it's all about learning experience, what they did at the time was we wrote the grant, they went out to the stakeholders, please sign this, sign off on this, and we'll apply. And, and, and DOA, I mean, CDC smelled right through and said, no, we need this, this comprehensive control plan has to be put together by stakeholders. I was hired with that purpose. We were able to create the coalition, which then got funding from CDC, CDC for many years uh, that also helped to bring nav money to navigation in the district. So um, models exist. We can do this. Thank you. Council Member Grasso. Thank you. I appreciate your answer there. And I, you know, I think uh, what you're talking about is how do we take what we know and create solutions for these situations. And so, you know, I can picture in my head certain things that already need to be done, right? So then the question is, what is this commission going to do, really, that's going to be any different than what we already know today needs to be done? Um, for example, uh, putting more primary care clinics in neighborhoods. That's something that we know right off the bat would change the experience. I think, Dr. Alexander, your point about, you know, 
how do you create a space where people feel comfortable coming into the clinic or coming into the, the health care delivery space that is um, a place where you feel comfortable, where you want to go, where you feel welcome? And that's a really tough one, you know, but it's not like we don't know what that means. It means it's clean. It means that it's friendly. It means that it's affordable. It means that it's close by so you don't have transportation <laughs> barriers. It means these things. Um, and some of that we've already done in the city. I mean, we're not, you know, crazy behind like some jurisdictions are. In fact, I was just out at the opening along with you, Chairwoman Alexandra, for the Breast Care for Washington 3D mammography right. machine that's going to be available in the community. That's a, that's a big deal. You know, that changes the way we deliver care. So I certainly don't want a commission that's going to come together and just sit around and talk about this stuff. I'd rather someone, an entity that's going to say to the D.C. government, I mean, this is really what it's about. It's how challenging us here in the council and in the Department of Health and elsewhere to fund these things, to put together these kinds of solutions and implement them. So, for example, another example, the um, we have a really actually pretty good loan repayment plan for primary care providers in the District of Columbia that has been, uh, as I've learned um, over the past couple months, updated, uh, has been funded to a certain extent, but yet we only finance people's uh, education to be in the communities at the rate of about five or six per year. That's not enough. We need to finance that. We need to put more money there. Um, and we can't just put $100,000. It has to be big money that goes into this to try to eliminate the disparities on the ground in the communities where the disparities exist. Yes, ma'am. May I address that? Two things. One, National Health Service Corps, which is a federal program, pays much more than the D.C. loan payment program. So that's one of the reasons why we haven't been successful in recruiting as many people to that program. The second is that there are structural barriers. Hold on, hold on. The, so the National Service Corps, is that? National Health Service Corps. National Health, and so that, you, that means you can get loan repayment and go anywhere where they designate a location in the country. In the district. Oh, it's, or it's for the anywhere in the country, but people who want to stay in the district oftentimes will look for National um, Health Service Corps loan repayment program over the D.C. one because you get more money from it. Right. Well, maybe the D.C. one should just uh, supplement that one. Perhaps. Right. The second thing is there's other structural barriers. So, for instance, I can speak as a PA for 35 years here in the district. Um, there were recent regulatory changes approved by um, D.C. government that um, in expanded scope of practice. And unfortunately, the Medicaid state plan does not, has not been updated right. yet. And so Unity Health System, which could benefit from hiring lots of PAs, they are unable to do so because their population is mostly Medicaid and they are strapped. Right. And so then you get back to the loan repayment. Well, you're not going to have people. I have to, I have to send students away that want to, graduates who want to stay in the district. But because um, that one thing that healthcare finance could do, update the state plan, hasn't been done. So we're losing all these health professionals that we train here to go somewhere else. Well, I mean, I think that there's a great example of how we can try to eliminate some of these barriers to get real, you know, get, get more, I should say, more qualified mm -hmm. professionals on the ground in the mm -hmm. district working and, and then expanding that. So, um, you know, when I talk about uh, UMC and I talk about the work that Huron's doing there, their recommendation to put three new clinics east of the river is a great idea right. um, and how to interact and relate with the hospital there is how we should deliver care. So, uh, you know, that's why I'm so supportive of it because it's not just a central huge building that mm -hmm. everyone has to go to. The other thing I think we ought to talk about that I, is important and I've learned a lot about in the past year or so is how do we create um, taking care of oneself, being engaged in the healthcare system, how do we make that a part of everyday life from a very young age? So, you, you know, to, for example, the Marie Reed uh, School has a health center in it that's a unity clinic that I toured that has to close. Community of Hope. Community of Hope. So that, that's right. So that, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. And they have to close, though, uh, in the afternoon when the school building closes. And so then how do parents and caregivers and other adults take advantage of that center if they need to, they can't, you know, because it closes. There should be these health centers in every single school. There should be the center of the, the, the community should be uh, available for some kind of health center. So anyway, I could go on and on about this. 
I don't want this commission to just reinvent the wheel over and over again and tell me what I already know that I've learned over the past couple years. And instead, I want them to come at us with some real actions that say, this is how you're going to get to this core of the problem, how you're going to get to the root of it and solve this problem. And, you know, it's not like it can just go away either. We have to be on this for years. It's not something that we should be, you know, disillusioned about and say, oh, we can just do one time and then it's going to be solved. This is nothing that is not going to continue. We need to keep working on it. I think one of the un un one of the untold stories around breast cancer in this city that I'd like to highlight, I worked with Dr. Huerta on a National Cancer Institute um, breast cancer navigation program. And we were funded because we had one of the highest rates of um, mortality for African American women uh, in the country. And we utilized healthcare navigator, patient navigators. And um, I have a federal grant that is located at Eastern High School. It's uh, to look at innovative ways to train healthcare workers um, that might not be your traditional healthcare worker. So we partnered, we got initial funding through the NCI grant, then we went to Coleman because we've now really mastered the art of breast cancer navigation in the city. And now we have money from Coleman because we have this program called Pink Divas. And Coleman is going to take this national. So they're going to use our model to reduce health disparities in women of color uh, specific for breast cancer. And we have one of our um, pink divas down at the Community of Hope site down in Ward 8. And so those are the things that we know, how, they're like the best untold story in the city, and yet we can't, ex we have to build capacity by expanding programs that I think are the traditional healthcare worker as opposed, in addition to the non-traditional healthcare worker. Thank you. And that goes back to your the state Medicaid plan issue, too, because mm -hmm. the universal exactly. whether or not they can do that. Did you want to add something, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, I know I may not look the part now, but I put myself through school as a personal trainer. Uh, so when I was actually at uh, uh, D.C. Department of Health, I was uh, uh, part of the process that created uh, the, I'm not sure what it's called, but the department that deals uh, with physical activity and nutrition. Uh, and, and I work with CDC on developing a state plan for the district. I never stuck around to see it into fruition. But I, I have to say that what we also need in a district which would definitely impact the future is a culture change. I mean, we concentrate, we put so much effort into graduating our children smart but not healthy. Uh, and we have to make an investment. I think uh, there are many interventions out there that I think Council, maybe Council Member Catania in the past, uh, I remember him call, calling these coloring book interventions. And they're great, they work, you know, if you, you know, get a grant and do this here in the community center, what have you. But I, I, through my years of experience, nothing will, will ever replace daily physical activity in the schools. Uh, if these children mm -hmm. learn that they don't need a $50, $90 membership at Gold's or a gym, that they can actually do calisthenics at home in their park, granted, I understand that a lot of these issues are, are, are city issues, environmental issues, where, you know, somebody might go out to the corner, run, and get hit by a straight bullet, God forbid, or get hit by a car because of city planning. But the, the people can be empowered if they, if they have daily physical activity in the schools, daily health education, teach them how to eat. I think that that, you know, it may seem simple, but I know the process is hard, but you, you'll see a culture change, you'll, you'll see an impact on, on health disparities that way too. Um, could, could I just echo what I just heard? I think that is just so important, is the, is the, um, the culture in the community, and how to get to that is such an important question. So um, I've been hearing again and again here today the emphasis again on the formal systems and the prof trained professionals, but the community has its role to play and thinking that through is just so critical. Great, thank you all very much. I thank you all for your testimony. I've been trying to lobby for the Wilson Building to have a fitness center <laughs> installed. So maybe they're listening to someone. Thank you all for your testimony. <laughs> now I'd like to call up um, the panels that uh, I skipped over, Dr. Waldu, Basalt Waldu, Associate Vice President for Howard University Health Sciences, and Dr. Ch Chilidum, oh here I go again, Ahagatu. 
Associate Dean, College of Medicine, Howard University. And Dr. Susan Leggett Johnson, Kaiser Permanente, along with Lori Kuyper, Senior Director, Government Relations with Kaiser Permanente. Welcome. And Dr. Walter, you may proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Committee Chair Ever Alexander and members of the committee. I am Fasawal, Associate Vice President for Clinical Affairs and Quality for Howard University Health Sciences. On behalf of the Howard University Interim President, Dr. Wayne Frederick, it is my pleasure today to present testimony on Bill Number 20-572, the Commission on Health Disparity Establishment Act of 2013. The purpose of this bill is to establish a commission of health disparity to examine health disparities in the district, produce a report on their findings and advise the Department of Health, the Council, and the District of Columbia, and the Mayor on the best way to address health disparity that exists in the District of Columbia. As you know, Howard University Hospital's rich tradition of leadership and service to Washington, D.C., and our nation's uh, and our nation dates back to 1862. Housed in the converted army barracks, it was initially called Freedom's Hospital and pro provided a refuge where ex-slaves received the medical care they were denied elsewhere. That tradition still drives Howard Mission today. In the late 1860s, Freedom's formed a partnership with Howard University College of Medicine to train African-American medical professionals. Together, the medical school and the hospital have served as a training ground for many of the nation's top African-American physicians. Over its 145 years history of providing the finest primary, secondary, and tertiary care services, Howard University Hospital has become one of the most comprehensive healthcare facility in the Washington metropolitan area. It is also designated as a DC level one trauma center. A private non-profit institution, Howard University Hospital is the nation's only teaching hospital located on the campus of historically black university. Therefore, I am here to note Howard's agreement with the need to address this particular health care disparity issue and, uh, and our agreement with the way in which Bill 20-572 in fact addresses them. We would like first to thank the chair for the committee, the, uh, on the, of the Committee on, of Health for the taking this opportunity to focus on much needed improvements in addressing health disparity in the District of Columbia. This bill will establish a commission on health disparity with the purpose of examining health disparities in each ward and in the district as they relate to race, ethnicity, age, sex, and social disparity determinants of health. The commission also will determine what remedies are needed and where resources need to be concentrated to, to mitigate health disparities in the city. Healthcare disparity, according to the Health Department's District of Columbia Committee, Community Health and Need Assessment, published on February 28th of 2014, mentions the same conditions that are addressed in this bill. Health indicators that, that disproportionately affect this district residents include diabetic, asthma, infant mortality, HIV AIDS, heart disease, stroke, breast cancer, cervical cancer, protest cancer, chronic kidney disease, sudden infant death syndrome, mental health, women's health issues, smoking cessation, oral disease, and immunization rate for children and their senior citizens. Over the years, a lot of great progress has been made, but a lot more remains. To address health disparities means to begin identifying the underlying reasons that have drive inequalities between groups that are often complex and social intrinsic. In addition to the current expansion of healthcare services and public health infrastructure, there is a need innovative behavioral research that will shed light on the formation of unhealthy habits and how small positive change can, can be incorporated into everyday routine. More data is needed to understand the role of social economic, social economic age and population dynamics in a city as transient as the district. This bill will provide this understanding by convening a commission that will study and help develop a strategy for inter 
intervention that will be effective in reducing death, preventing disease, and ultimately lowering the cost of health care and achieving health equity for all. We want to note, finally, that Bill 20-572 that establishes the Commission will facilitate communication and partnership between district agencies and the wider provider community to develop greater understanding of the intersection between agency activities and health outcomes. The Commission also hopes to facilitate development of interagency initiatives to address the social, economic, the, the, the social and economic determinants of health and key health disparities issue, including but not limited to healthcare access and quality, housing availability and quality, transportation availability, employment, workforce development, and education access and quality. Howard University continues to be a partner with the district government to help, to help address health care disparities in the state of Columbia. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important matter. I'm, I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Chile Ahagotu. I am uh, a practicing physician in the D.C. area as well as a professor of urology at Howard University. And it's my distinct pleasure to be here to participate in these proceedings. Um, uh, I am a user of the healthcare system in the district, and so I feel uh, very much uh, uh, vested in uh, our ability to drive uh, a better healthcare system all around. Uh, and so um, it's really a, a, a privilege to be here and, and to, to testify. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, otherwise known as ACA, provides the overarching framework for enhanced access to high quality health care at affordable prices by one, expanding and improving existing entitlement programs, realigning health care provider incentives to promote in, uh, integrated care models, three, promoting innovative strategies to reduce waste and empowering our patients through health information technology, more health care coverage options, and greater access to health promotion programs. In addition to expanding health care access for the 45 million, uh, probably less than that now, uninsured U.S. citizens, the ACA mandates more fiscal responsibility and measurable value creation by health care delivery systems. As such, healthcare care organizations across the country are reevaluating their strategic and operational priorities to meet this new direction. On the local front, despite having health care uh, insurance coverage rates that exceed 95 percent, we've talked about that already, the District of Columbia has some of the highest disease-specific mortality rates in the country. Areas of particular concern include diabetic complications, cardiovascular mortality, cancer incidents, and death rates, just to name a few. Madam Chair, this tells me that the problem is not just about having access, but about the kind of access. And we've talked extensively about some of the factors that revolve around this. So in other words, the method of healthcare delivery in some ways is flawed. If we take a look at the district's most vulnerable population, it may help to shed some light on this issue. For example, 64% of the $2.2 billion of Medicare gross funding in the fiscal year 2012 went towards acute care services. The vast majority of that was emergency room and inpatient and, um, admissions. Often those types of um, care services, although are important, are often um, 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 a source of waste. And so I think that uh, that is an area that we need to consider in healthcare um, uh, remodeling. Creating a healthcare delivery system that is strategically situated in healthcare needy communities in the district, but with a focus on ambulatory care, education, awareness, and preventative care services, refocuses our resources to achieve value based outcomes. So what could one of the models look like uh, in, uh, and, and possibly this commission could look at this? And we've kind of touched on it and talked about it in different ways so far. A urban health initiative that utilizes a community health operational model that focuses on community enrichment, levering Howard University's legacy of community-focused healthcare delivery, medical research, and education in diverse populations. Creation of a 
patient-oriented team-based integrated system that refocuses the organizational objectives to the unmet needs of our patients. And I think that that's a big issue here, that many of our patients are just not getting the care that they need. So by taking this approach in the context of the community, the healthcare provider is better positioned to proactively uh, respond to the healthcare needs of that community. This community-centered model aligns the strategic priorities of the healthcare provider with those of critical healthcare community stakeholders, and we've talked about some of them, nursing homes, home health uh, agencies, community-based organizations, uh, primary care networks, and such. And this, in turn, creates opportunities for operational synergies, shared competencies and resources, and creation of shared value for the community. The end product is a robust, patient-oriented healthcare delivery system that extends across the continuum of care. It is important to note that emerging trends in healthcare technology, policy, and finance are stressing almost every U.S. healthcare organization, but particularly those that assume a disproportionate responsibility of caring for resource-poor communities. Creating and implementing an urban health initiative that features a community-centered, accountable care delivery model will position the District of Columbia to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to U.S. health care reform and provide Howard University, for example, with the opportunity to deliver a richer patient value proposition and enhance its role as the district's natural community health partner. Patients will experience new channels to access health information, models for health-seeking behavior, and a shared vision for healthy living. Thank you once again for allowing me to participate in these proceedings, and I'm also available for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairwoman Alexander. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on behalf of Kaiser Permanente. I'm the Senior Director of Government Relations for Kaiser, and I'm very fortunate to have with me today Dr. Susan Leggett-Johnson. Uh, Dr. Leggett Johnson is an Associate Medical Director and Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Permanente, the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group, um, and she, in that role she oversees uh, much of the health disparity work that we do in the Mid-Atlantic region. She's going to be providing most of our testimony today, but before I turn it over to, to her, I just wanted to mention that Kaiser Permanente strongly supports B20 572, and we would like to commend the council members that have introduced the bill for rolling up their sleeves and taking a proactive step to take a look at health disparities in the district and find some solutions to begin reducing them. Um, and I would also say that if and when the bill is enacted and passed by the council, signed into law, we would very much welcome the opportunity to participate in, in whatever capacity or role you think is, um, is um, something that would be fitting for us. Um, I apologize, we don't have our written testimony submitted yet, but we have submitted several um, handouts. One is a handout related to the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and health care. It's put together, prepared by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Leggett Johnson will be referring to that in her testimony. And then also a packet of health educational materials that are prepared by Kaiser Permanente. Our providers and physicians use these um, with their patients in our efforts to continually reduce health care disparities. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Leggett Johnson and have her provide her testimony. So thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity today. I am also a practicing internal medicine physician, and I've been practicing in this area for about mm, 25 years after my training with Howard University. So, <laughs> so, um, so I do have a good sense of what's going on in the community around me. And as a practicing physician with Kaiser Permanente, your experiences are also our experiences. And, and we see patients. You mentioned already that access to care is not the problem. We know that from the Institute of Medicine's report is unconscious bias, is social determinants. It is one of the big things we haven't said much today, culturally competent, proficient care and language barriers. Those are some things we can address and we can change and impact right away. And we found that that has made a tremendous difference in getting the care to where it's needed and getting through the barriers that you might have up with patients. Um, we also 
um, know that the cultural and linguistic appropriate service standards is a roadmap that has been presented that came out a number of years ago. We took that very seriously as well as the report from uh, the Institute of Medicine. And at that point, we decided that our vision for Kaiser Permanente was that Kaiser Permanente would be the leader in eliminating disparities in health and health care. We will do this by providing equitable care to our members, targeting resources to areas of need in the communities we serve, and identifying and implementing strategies and policies that support equity in health nationwide, including health care reform. And so we've been on this journey for a number of years, and there are a number of things we've learned while we've been on this journey. One is, uh, just like the class standards say, you have to have the data. You have to know who your populations are. You have to know how you're currently doing. Because if you don't know how you're currently doing, you won't make a change. And you have to put it out there. So we hold our physicians very accountable. You asked about that earlier for their panel of patients. So if I have a panel of patients and my patients haven't had mammograms, I need to be accountable for why is that? Not because they didn't just come in to see me. I can pick up the phone and call them. I can also do a video conference with them. I can do a telephone call with them. Uh, I can reach them. So the question is why haven't I done it? Or if I've done it, why hasn't the patient responded? And that's where we get into some of the cultural proficiency of the care that we provide. We also have an opportunity to look at our physician's member patient satisfaction scores. And um, it will tell us sometimes if there's a population that that particular physician is not connecting well with. We have training for that. We have cultural proficiency training that we can provide to those physicians to help them connect in a better way to that particular community. We also get involved with the community through our community partnerships and through our multicultural resource groups, and we have them out in community giving us feedback about what's going on. And we run regular reports to see what our disparity gaps are. So you said, well, what areas would you look at? High blood pressure. If you don't look at it, you won't make the adjustment. And we started to look at, okay, in our African-American population in the district, that's our highest area for uncontrolled blood pressure. What can we do about it? Well, we need to connect with those patients, but we also need to address them where they are. So if a patient comes in for, um, for let's say, an eye exam or an orthopedic visit, there's no reason why we can't talk about the blood pressure, have it addressed if it's elevated that day, scan them, I mean, uh, set them up for a mammogram, and even have the mammogram done while they're still in the building. And that way we don't have the barrier of I don't have time to come back, I can't take off work, um, I don't want to pay the extra copays and the various barriers that come up. So we've been looking at some of the challenges. It is opportunity to come in. It is um, not having the time. It is not understanding why, and that's why we have culturally proficient information that we can share to try to connect patients where they are. And then we have lots of things that we put in place that are resources for our physicians, collecting the data, looking at the data, incentivizing the physicians. So of course you ask about that. Yes, that is something we can do. Yes, it makes a difference. Um, not every patient can connect with us on secure messaging, so how do we connect with that patient? So we look at the various ways with our language barrier patients. We have interpreters, we have the language line, we try to provide information in the language that they can read. Um, we try to connect with the patients where they are. We have video sign language interpretation, so if the person needs an appointment today, Usually you have to wait 24 hours to get a sign language interpreter. Well, we can use video sign language interpretation, and that way we avoid the barrier there. So looking at all the opportunities, you talked about emergency room visit. So we opened up on Capitol Hill the critical decision unit to see those patients any time of the day and any time of the night and then plug them right back into their primary care physician because we know that this coordinated care will also become a barrier for the care that's needed. So I know my time is up, but 
Um, I think there are a lot of things that district can do, and I think there are a lot of things we've learned over time and a lot more we still can do, and, and we would love to share any of our learnings to help along with this process. Thank you, and um, that will be a 10-minute round of questions. Thank you all for your testimony. You know, I was just thinking, and I know Kaiser has a model um, as far as um, access that you you are able to access all of those services uh, in that particular um, setting. But not all um, doctor's offices are, are like that. Uh, so you should have a, a, an advantage there to capture all of the services in one visit. I just had a thought, and my actually my dog, uh, he has an HMO, and his doctor <laughs> sends notices out, I mean, more than my doctor sends notices out for me. I mean, they are on point. It's time for his comprehensive exam. It's time for his immunizations. And I'm like, that's kind of crazy that, you know, my veterinarian is sending um, my dog. I mean, he's in perfect health. And he's old. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, why doesn't my doctor call me and let me know why haven't I been in? You know, so, I mean, my dog may be taking care of me in my old age. Uh, but that, that is a concept. And when you ask them how could Kaiser um, help, how could um, insurance companies or how could Kaiser um, help the, the commission? In what ways? I, mean. um, I think sharing some of the learnings that we have, understanding the reports that we have, and seeing what our centers of excellence, we have across the country developed a number of centers of excellence. Center of Excellence in Sickle Cell, Center of, you know, and we know Howard has a Center of Excellence in Sickle Cell, Center of Excellence in our um, Latino population for diabetic care, uh, Center of Excellence in Women's Health. Uh, we have um, Mid-Atlantic States actually has one of the highest um, preventive screening for breast cancer rates in the country. So how do you do that? Part of it is being under one roof, but part of it is just what you said. It's being relentless. So developing that sense of relentlessness so that when your doctor sends you that card in the mail and you don't respond, we know you didn't respond, so there's some kind of follow-up maybe a couple months later. So being relentless in some areas. So sharing some of the centers of excellence. Work. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Waldu, I wanted to ask you, um, and you, Dr. Ahagatu. <laughs> you can call me Chili. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for your testimonies. Thank you. I want to know what role um, could Howard University play in this initiative? And I know for both of you and all of you at the panel, I know you serve a lot of the um, population that we definitely want to target. Um, so how can we, what are you seeing for one, are you seeing people come in at later yes. um, stages of illnesses and what, can, what role can you play? I think generally uh, we need to look at especially what uh, mental health plays a role in, especially mental health and behavioral health, uh, 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 to how to navigate through the healthcare system. Because now you said mental health and, and what other? Behavioral health. Behavioral health, thank you. So there are a lot of behavioral factors of, of health. So these two issues, if you are, if you, if you are, if you are in mentally or behaviorally challenged, uh, your ability to navigate through the healthcare system is very difficult. So we, we like to follow up the, the number of people that come to our emergency room are largely people with mental health issues that are undiagnosed or untreated mental health issues. So. Identifying uh, uh, those those people and providing them access point and continue to provide healthcare services to them, which is how it uh, can provide a comprehensive and wraparound services that identifies not only the mental health issues. Maybe there is drug, alcohol addiction. They might have, they, they might be diabetic. They might have heart disease or other diseases. So how do we provide wraparound services and also to make sure that. The, the, the insurance companies are covering some of this, this uh, from, you know, diabetics. They have a problem in accessing medication. So making sure that they don't come back. And, and, and when they come back, they are getting the appropriate care the first time they come. And uh, when they go and try to access medication, they don't have a difficult time 
to access them. So those are some of the things that we can we can work on. So could you briefly describe this new health care delivery system? Sure. Um, what would that look like? On that. So, you know, when I think of health care disparities, I think of an unmet need. I mean, we already know that lots of folks in the city have insurance. The issue is, if they have all of this insurance, why are they still sick? And I do believe a big part of that is not only that they're not getting to the health care delivery system, but when they get to the health care delivery system, they're not having the kind of experience that would foster better outcomes. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that we have bad doctors, because I don't think we do, really. I think the issue is how does the health care system interact with the patient? And that's what I'm talking about, this new model. So as the doctor here mentioned, um, realigning our resources in a way that makes the provider more in tune with what that patient needs. And we're not just talking about the medical needs, we're talking about those social needs. For example, the issue of a 24-hour access center or patient access center. Most hospitals and most healthcare delivery systems have call centers that usually operate from 9 in the morning till 5. They typically handle mostly um, things like uh, you know, uh, appointments and such. But if you expand the scope of that, because that's a major touch point for your patients, to providing um, medication reconciliation, um, getting that patient to a away from the emergency room and maybe to an urgent care type of facility, uh, maybe even having someone come to their home and uh, do some care coordination at home or some home visits. So I think that by redirecting some of the resources that we spend on a lot of acute care services, that we'll free up resources to do those kind of innovative um, types of services. And I think it has to begin with embedding the facility in a community that is resource poor. So you can use Ward 8 as an example. You can have a modified hospital type of facility that has inpatient capacity but short short stay inpatient capacity, but also has ambulatory capacity as well, provide, of course, robust pay, uh, primary care services, but also the ability to provide specialty services. And more importantly, will interact with those critical community-based organizations that understand what those social determinants are and can really provide um, provide a clearer picture for the providers as to what those patients need, and then creating a payment model that supports that and that realigns that. And that's the sort of the last piece of the puzzle. And all of this is driven by a very robust IT platform is, is what the doctor, so you can actually understand what you're actually spending on these patients at a very granular level. And you can now start looking at unit costs that it takes to, 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 to care for particular activities. And I think that that's the kind of model that, that we need to try to push. So this. is it recommended, do you think that we should target one um, disease at a time, or maybe, you know, just a, a select targeted group so that we can see um, real results? And, and what would you recommend? I don't, there's not really a hierarchy of yeah. priorities yeah. when it comes to illnesses, but, but what would you suggest um, would well, be some uh, of the major things to tackle yeah, on the yeah, district? Diabetic management is one, heart disease another, cancer is a third one. I mean, those three are really a major issue that needs to be addressed and you might want The other thing you could do, and, and Kaiser, uh, one of my friends is the CFO at Kaiser in California, Chip Newman, he's a good, good guy, and he, he is, he's, his uh, group has been working on identifying that group of patients, those high utilizers. So we already know that about 5% of the population, particularly in that Medicaid population, accounts for about 50% of the cost. So if we have uh, mechanisms to identify those individuals, then you can focus on that because those are the patients who are probably going to fall through the cracks. Those are the patients who are probably going to come in with advanced disease and have all these complications. And so if you were going to start, that would, might be a, a good area to look at, those high utilizers. So, and let me just follow up on that because Kaiser um, 
everyone has Kaiser's insurance uh, for Kaiser. So what would be your, I mean, what, what are the barriers or what are the disparities when it comes to your insured population? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have a, a Medicaid population. Is there a lower income population? Are there social determinants? Have you done any studies in terms of the health care of your population? Um, we, when we look at the report, we not only look at race, gender, we also look at um, social determinants based on what we know to see how we're doing. So we actually look at that. How are we doing with high blood pressure across the board? And does it matter? And what we found is that the social determinants don't make as big of a difference as we might think sometimes. It, it really is, you know, it's not always the same. For instance, our most educated women are the ones who are not immunizing their children. So um, sometimes it's just the opposite of what you think. Um, but, I, but I think that our learning is the same. We do actually have Medicaid uh, patients, not in the district, but in Virginia and Maryland. So we actually do. And we find that the patient will come in with a less, less educated on health care. And the journey to get them from here to there it requires a little bit more heavy lifting, so we put more effort. We want you to know this, this, and this. So if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, we want you to learn as much as we can teach you about the high blood pressure and diabetes as early as possible, and then keep reinforcing that message, reinforcing the message. Um, so I think that's one. Meet them where they are. And, and Council Member Grosso, I'm going to acknowledge you for a minute, but we were discussing for maybe the educated um, population or the working time is is an element. Have doctors considered maybe extending their hours, evening hours, working on weekends maybe, uh, to reach populations who, you know, work the same hours as you do? It's really hard. And, you know, when, when people take off during the day for a doctor's appointment, and I'm guilty of this, too, even when it comes to staff. I'm like, you need to do your personal things on your time, not my time. Yeah. Uh, but we need to be um, yeah. cognizant of that, that, you know, you can't work yeah. it in. So you want everyone to be healthy and go to the doctor. But maybe we need to take a look at how, you know, we can kind of um, cater to a lot of working persons' needs, too, that may be missing appointments because just a simple element of time. So I can comment on that. We actually recently changed the schedule um, to have later appointments, just a little later to try to catch patients when they're just coming off work. And while the physicians didn't really like it, <laughs> the patients love it. And so that's the story. So we keep putting those stories in front of the physicians about why that matters. But we also created house calls. And so it's an opportunity to actually have a video conference with the physician. And in some cases, it doesn't have to be a person to person I, in face-to-face -face visit. I have a rash. You can actually take a pretty good picture of that rash. And you can share that and you can have a conversation and I can treat you sometimes effectively without a face-to-face, -face, which helps with the driving and the time from work, et cetera. So we have done that and then the ex and we're expanding that because patients really like it. And, um, and then the extended hour urgent care. And we've been talking about Saturdays and evenings that's to come. Maybe even Sundays. Maybe even Sundays. <laughs> Council Member Grasso? Yes, thank you. Just on that follow up on what you were just saying there. The, the, my father-in-law the other day, uh, he's entering into a kind of a study um, and at the VA um, and he um, they had to do a TB test before he was allowed into the study so he took the TB test and then he was going to have to travel back over there to get them to read it and so I suggested he works for the FCC which is in you know down the portals I said you have a health clinic in the building why don't you ask them if they can read it for you so he did that and he went down they certified that it was not active and that it was not TB and sent the I think they did have to fax it. But anyway, they sent the notification over there that it was clear, and that saved that travel time. I think that's what you're talking about, which is vital. I'm a little bit nervous about um, trying to say that we should focus on one particular disease or on one particular kind of indicator of disparity in this regard. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, uh, that 
if we're going to use medical homes and information technology to inform our approach and all that, I think that's important. I think it's starting to be done, and I think we should do it wholeheartedly. That doesn't necessarily answer the question of why are there disparities in our mm -hmm. communities. And so we have to, I think, be careful not to just jump to how do we solve people having diabetes. That's important, and we should solve that. Mm -hmm. But first, I think we have to question some of the more fundamental things that are community-based or our neighborhood-based or our city-based that um, keep people from engaging in the system as a whole and in the, the health care delivery programs. And that goes to questions around, I think, more around where are the facilities located, how many providers do we have on the streets, things like that. And um, that's, I just think, a different angle. So I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but it's, for me it's about not so much the approach on how to end heart disease, which is important, but more about how do we get everyone into that approach. And, um, I, I, and I do want to note, I do hear exactly what you're saying about this um, medical home approach, the fact that you have to have it be driven by information around just, you know, the, you know, kind of level of care that you, and then how you approach it is from the people that, you know, keep them from moving into multiple needs and, and all of that. And I think there's really value in that. I don't think this commission is for that. I think this commission is more about what I said before, which is about um, society's, you know, barriers to particular demographics getting the care they need um, where they are. And then from there, moving into solving these bigger health care problems. Does that make so sense? I'll, yeah, absolutely, and I'll come, and I agree with you 100%. I, I don't think that approaching this from a disease model is going to be very effective. I think it's, it's too big of an issue to look at it from that perspective. But I do think a starting point could be identifying a particular group that may be at high risk. So if you look at those high utilizer Medicaid population, Many of them across the board have, you know, higher um, or poorer outcomes irrespective of whatever their diagnosis is. And I mean, I'm generalizing, but I think that that may be a starting point if there was a particular target population you wanted to look at. I but do one, one thought yeah. on that. I think if we, I, we can, I think that's useful and I think it's interesting. I think if you identify that, then the solutions to that are going to be across the for everything. You know, I don't. What I'm thinking of when I think of disparities and a commission on disparities is more about those broader solutions to getting the care people need for all those things, for heart disease, for diabetes, for all the comorbidities that you you know that you would imagine. And and that I think is really the question. Is that what you're saying? Is that yes? Sense? And I, I think I'm, I think I'm saying the same. Oh, good. Thing, okay. Is, simply I'm is a doctor, so. you have to identify that high risk population. And that high-risk population often coincides with a particular type of payer. And that's why I'm I suspecting that you might be able to identify, because otherwise it may be hard to find out a way to catch that group of individuals. I think an important aspect of this is realigning incentives in a way that healthcare organizations are better suited to interact with that's the community. Right. And I think that you know, I mean, I think that's something that this commission should really consider. I actually think that, think that a better, I think the, I don't know this for sure, so I wouldn't want to say with that much certainty, but I do think that uh, investing in primary care, you know, whether it be nurse practitioners, primary care docs, whoever, to spend time with patients mm -hmm. it would be a very wise investment for across all payers, across every type of pair because that interaction that time you know like so you know i re-engaged with my primary care a new primary care about two years ago and we set it up that i was going to go you know every six months to try to make sure that i understood my own health care needs and that needs to happen i think at every level and would definitely decrease disparities because if you have more of those kinds of you know uh, health care providers whoever they are whatever level engaging one-on-one -on -one with a patient for a longer period of time. And so you have to get away from that kind of payment model that we've had for so long where you basically just invested in quantity and numbers of patients that you could possibly see in a minute and not in the outcomes and not in the quality of the time that you spend. And I, I completely, I, I think that's the future of our healthcare system. But I also think that if we're not careful, the kind of biases against being engaged in poor communities, the biases against 
you know, being kind of really involved with the people that are really on the fringes is going to continue to create disparities even in that model. And sure. so we have to be careful. And that's what I'm hoping this commission will get in front of that and be able to stop that as we move towards a more primary care based medical home model uh, across our system. But they, they, they should, they should, as, as, you know, if instead of having uh, physician centered healthcare delivery system, we have healthcare professional centered healthcare delivery system. That's right. Which means that, uh, but right now that's not how it works. You know, uh, uh, advanced practical nurses can do a lot more than what they are doing now. That's right. Physician assistant can do a lot more than they can, they are doing now. Uh, so the, the, if we, the access issue, for example, if you want to make an appointment with a physician, it might take between two and three months. Now, who's going to wait for that long? What are they going to do? Well, they're remember, going to show up, in, two going to show up in, right. into, into an emergency room. Right. So unless we change that dynamics and, and have paraprofessionals and other professionals who are able to provide that, that screening model where the, the patients have access, they know the person, they know the family, they That's know right. All of their in the community, and they can spend a lot more time with, with the patient. Then they, they can refer them to a higher level of care. Then you will have a, a, a better outcome. That's so right. now people are going, or everybody's just going like a flood into the same direction. And obviously, some people are going to be there's going to be a bottleneck That's somewhere, right. and people are going to have access. So I think we need to look at how we reimburse healthcare professionals. I think there are the lowest available. The educational system has changed in such a level where there are healthcare professionals who can do a lot more. I completely agree with you, and I think ultimately, I mean, my bias is that that level of care that we're talking about that needs to be almost in everyone's living room, that really base primary yeah. care level that kind of gets to the care of people, um, I believe the government needs to pay for that across the board. And I think that it should be a system that actually says, well, I believe that you have to have, a, a, you know, I think for a certain level of care, if the government doesn't take this on, then I don't think you'll ever see it happening. Now, do I still think there's a role for, you know, carriers and insurance? Absolutely. There's a big role for them. That's that next level that you're talking about. But I think it's our responsibility and our obligation, one way or another, to, to make sure that every neighborhood or every community in the city has access that's clean, high quality and basically 24-7 for anyone that can walk in and just get the care they need right there and then, which is what you guys are talking about, which, which is what you're moving towards. That's what we need to do across the city. And then I think what you'll see is a you know, lessening of the stigmas, a lessening of the fear of going in, a more of a welcoming environment ultimately, and then Somebody less disparities and healthier people uh, in the long run. Council yeah. Member Grasso, Kaiser Permanente would very much agree with you on your position on the need for reimbursement reform. I think we've supported that nationally Absolutely. for quite a number of years now. And I think, as you know, um, the current fee-for-service model creates all kinds of problems and probably directly adds to the health disparities issue. Um, I, I won't speak for Dr. Leggett Johnson here, but our Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group physicians are all salaried physicians, and the incentive is very, very different. That's it's right. about care for our patients. I don't know if you have Did you want to add something? Uh, well, I was going to say something else, and that is I, I see the vision. I think there are some huge challenges with it, and one is the availability of healthcare providers to be available to be that, you know, around the city like that. It would be great. I, I agree with you. So given that, and maybe that's the model for the future as you hire and, and attract and retain, um, I think there are some things that can start happening now. Again, even looking at the class standards, engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. Um, I don't think there's a lot of accountability right now. So if I'm in a fee-for-service model, I'll show you the difference, fee-for-service model, and I have a panel of patients, there is nobody knocking on my door saying, how come None of your women over 50 have had a mammogram. Why not? There's nobody asking questions. We're asking our doctors that every day. But why isn't the government or someone saying that? And so you would think, well, would the government ever get involved? I'll give you one other example. I actually had the opportunity to go to Cuba, and there are opportunities to go and look at the healthcare system. And the government is very much involved, but they have um, they have uh, physicians in the community, and they have community uh, ombudsmen, they call it something else, that whose job it is to make sure that the community is connected because that changed 
the woman was talking about is real, is critical. You've got to have that peer pressure from the community. And they give their primary care doctors a report on how well you're doing, your mammograms, your pap smears, your, they get it. So they know how well they're doing. And then they, of course, incentivize that. But it, 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 it works really well for them. Um, so there are some things that we absolutely can do. And, and aside from that, we're supporting some of our local students who are in Cuba getting medical training who are going to come back here and practice. Um, I'm sorry, so, Doctor. Can I ask you who gives the report to the doctors the or the government? Yeah, the government. The the who so like our board of medicine. Yes, mm -hmm. but they work for the government. They, they, yeah, yeah. The doctors work for the government. Yeah, yeah but it but it works really well. It, it works <laughs> exactly. Well. exactly. <laughs> so it's a different a lot model. Of community clinics that do that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, my outcomes are measured. Right. We're not that far from it. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you all for your thank testimony. You thank, you. thank you. I think I have one more public witness before we hear from our executive, Mr. Guy Weston, Executive Director, DC Care Consortium. Come right up. You're welcome. Is there any other public witness that would like to testify? Go right ahead, Mr. West. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member Alexander, other council persons and colleagues. My name is Guy Weston. I'm the Executive Director of DC Care Consortium, which is the HIV AIDS service organization in Ward 4. My experience related to health disparities go back to the period of the 1985 HHS Secretary's Report on Black and Minority Health, and I go back that far because it's interesting to look at how things have changed over the last 30 years, and I would like to briefly share with you some observations from initiatives from various jurisdictions, including the District of Columbia, over the last three decades that either facilitate or complicate efforts to promote health equity among populations that have disproportionate burdens of adverse health conditions. And I would, given our time limit, like to focus solely on the first duty of the proposed commission, which is examining health disparities. The proposed legislation calls for comprehensive recommendations with examined health disparities in each ward of the district. That sounds like a very reasonable proposition, but in fact, it frequently becomes quite complicated. First and foremost, we do not have consistent data collection by ward across the multitude of databases that will be utilized for such an endeavor. Where data do exist, it's not uncommon to use zip code as a proxy for ward. This is not a reliable method as it produces errors in about 30% of cases. If we want to examine health outcomes by ward, we first need a reliable system to collect health data by ward. There are also other data collection issues, and there are numerous, but one I would call to your attention is reliable data collection about Latino and Hispanic populations, which are often misclassified. Many times we don't know the true health outcomes of Latino populations because they're classified as either black or white, depending on what they look like, instead of how they personally identify. And that's personally driven by federal standards for uh, data collection, which many providers don't understand. Secondly, health disparities are largely a social phenomenon. Over the last decade or so, social determinants of health have become popular buzzword. Nevertheless, we have a public health workforce and mentality about health promotion, which relies largely on training in the biological and sciences and biostatistics. If we want to understand a social phenomenon, we need to engage medical sociologists, medical anthropologists, and people who understand health from a social perspective. To use my field of HIV AIDS as an example, when we ask questions like why African American women account for 92% of HIV AIDS cases when they only account for 51% of the district's population, or when African Americans overall account for 50% of the population, rarely do we get a straight answer. If we can't get a straight answer to that question, we can't expect a reasonable strategy to be implemented to address the problem. In brief, we know that. HIV AIDS rate should be understood in the larger context of the inferior health status of African American population as a whole. We know that the leading causes of death in the United States are heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory diseases, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, and diabetes. African Americans are disproportionately affected by all of these diseases. So maybe the disproportionate incidence of HIV affection among African and women, African American women is less about fancy condom messages or condom campaigns and more about addressing the root causes of why African American populations overall have poor health outcomes. 
Thirdly, we need to better understand how social determinants such as geography, social networks, stigma, poverty, insurance status, traditional gender roles, religious beliefs, as well as racism and homophobia, whether perceived or real, impact on health behaviors and utilization of health services. Many of these factors fall outside the sphere of health programs, but they still are influential in health outcomes, so we need to engage other sectors to address health outcomes. Uh, I wanted to make a few other comments that weren't part of my written record, one of which was that we have to have meaningful metrics to measure progress and promote accountability. Many times we have metrics like reduce the incidence of a disease by 50% in three years. That's never going to happen. So people don't even take it seriously, and it's not useful for the purpose of monitoring accountability. Sometimes I've worked in government systems where the indicators, the performance indicators, impact on a manager's performance evaluation or on the agency's performance evaluation. So they're not taken seriously or people are afraid to report actual outcomes because of how they may impact on them personally as managers. So we have to find ways to measure outcomes without those political interferences. I wanted to comment also on whether we have a single disease approach. I think that's not wise. It's not about a disease. It's about health behaviors, health beliefs, health services, utilization of health services, healthcare infrastructure, cultural competence, and provider relationships with underserved communities. If we want to address underserved populations as a whole and their disparities, it's not about a particular germ or health condition, it's about the larger issues that we have to address. Uh, lastly, I want to say that we would be remiss if we did not include individual behavior in defining the problem. At the same time, we can't focus solely on individual behavior because behavior does not occur in a vacuum and there are other factors besides behavior that affect health outcomes. Finally, I thank you for this opportunity to share my perspectives with you and I look forward to the passage of this bill and all the important work that will follow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weston, and uh, that's what these hearings are about, to hear uh, the different views from the um, witnesses who testify. Uh, and I am compelled by um, some of your statements or views in your testimony, I do appreciate them. Uh, what would be a reliable system, um, first off, to collect the data by ward? And what's happening now, because I do know we do have some statistics by ward, like we know wards 5, 7, and 8 may have higher mortality rates and higher instances um, of some cancers and diabetes and um, hypertension. So. What data is being collected now, and what do you think needs to be improved? Well, I speak as a, I was a government employee 10 years ago, so part of my experience is historical, but even as a provider that's funded by the district government, I know, for example, that um, there needs to be a system where you can type in an address and then a ward will be assigned. It's not up to asking somebody what ward they live in. It's not up to look at that they live in 2005, that must be ward 2. That might, that, in that case, that works, but in many cases, it doesn't work. So we don't have a common understanding or a common practice across all agencies to collect information. The fact that you have a report that says you have a number of 90 associated with a particular ward doesn't, you don't know how anybody arrived at that 90. It could be that somebody said, oh, they did it by zip code, or that they asked the person what ward they live in, or somebody made an observation, but there is no uh, system-wide uh, approach to collect so, data by ward. So are you familiar with the um, Department of Health's community needs assessment or community health assessment? As a provider, I am, yes. So how do you know, um, right offhand, how these um, statistics were? Um, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable commenting in public on that because it wouldn't be fair to the people who actually did the work who I have not communicated with. However, they have to well, rely I'm asking you, and then <laughs> I'm asking you to rely on, it's not the people themselves at the health department that make those determinations necessarily. They have to rely on providers. They have to rely on self-report. They have to rely on information coming from a lot of different places. So it has to be that where the data are collected, there's a mechanism to associate and address with the ward. Anything else is suspect. Uh, thank you. You also uh, mentioned that it may be more like, what are the additional questions? You use the example of HIV AIDS with African American women, and you're saying that we need to ask um, deeper questions as to why um, it's a higher percentage when the overall African American rate is lower. Why would the women um, be so much higher in that 
particular um, subgroup. So what, aside from a condom campaign, would you recommend? When you say find the root causes, oh, okay. these are some of the things you think the commission sure, should sure. Really okay. look so at. So if we're talking about HIV AIDS and, and women, we have to think about things like traditional gender roles. We have to think about things like if we have a patriarchal society engaging men, because ultimately uh, men are going to have impact on women's health outcomes. We have to think about uh, cultures where women value their families, their husbands, and their children over themselves. So it's not about giving information. HIV is a, a disease that can cause you illness. It's about teaching women to value themselves and maybe how to juggle multiple responsibilities and not put off HIV because it takes many years before it becomes uh, a serious problem. So it's a matter of um, dealing with the reasons why people put off health care, dealing with the reasons why people don't believe that HIV is a threat. People don't feel vulnerable to HIV. That's not about knowing HIV is a uh, disease that can be fatal. It's about making people feel vulnerable. And it has nothing to do with information. It's about convincing people that it's relevant to them. And uh, you mentioned social determinants, and that is a buzzword. Uh, I think it is important. I think there are social factors that definitely um, result in um, better healthcare outcomes. But what, what do you, could you explain further what you mean we need a better understanding of I the I think that we tend to look at disease in terms of germs, in terms of patients, in terms of individual actions of people, and we don't understand, for example, that even if um, the health center where I go in my neighborhood is not homophobic and I'm a gay man, I'm afraid they're homophobic, so I don't go. That has nothing to do with whether they really are or not. Uh, or I'm afraid that they're racist because they're white and I'm black. It may be that they're racist. It may be that I think they're racist. It may be that their particular way of communicating is not comfortable to me. So how do you teach providers to be culturally competent? How do you teach providers to value the patient's perspective? Another thing that happens very often, uh, there's a, um, a belief sometimes that our providers tell us things that we can't ask questions. People have to be empowered to ask questions. That's interesting that you say that. And I could say on the flip side, a lot of persons I talk to um, think for some reason if a provider accepts Medicaid and they have commercial insurance, they don't want to go to the same doctor who is providing treatment to Medicaid That's patients another example. for thinking that they're not going to get the best treatment. And I never understood that as working for a Medicaid HMO. And, you know, it, it was really unusual to me that we actually went to the same providers um, that our, our customers went to. So it didn't, you know, it didn't connect with me. But I can understand why people do have those um, worries, and it may prevent them from going uh, to a particular doctor. So that is good to look at other things that we need to talk about was preventing people um, from getting the health care that they need. You also mentioned you're worried about um, about when it comes to accurate reporting that people's jobs are on the line. So if, say for example, oh, okay. if, I, I know. yeah, what, what you added to it. So say for example, if um, DOH reported that, you know, cancer has doubled uh, in 2014, but yet we allocated millions of dollars towards reducing cancer. You think that they would be afraid to report that it doubled because we've allocated funding towards that initiative? So you think that they may um, skew I was just speak in very general terms that I've been in many discussions where people are concerned about performance indicators and their impact on performance evaluations. Uh, or people want to define performance indicators in a way that will highlight uh, progress and not necessarily emphasize failure. But the larger issue is that many health indicators fall outside the scope of, you can't, for example, say that you allocated a million dollars this year and you expect HIV to go next year. Or that you have a needle exchange program in War II uh, in 2014 and you expect to see a reduced incidence of HIV. And so people try to connect the dots closer than they can be connected. So part of it is, be more realistic about what you can attribute to a particular behavior.
it could be that we may need to put more resources right. in that initiative, and that's why we're not getting the results. Or, that or it could be that you need to wait five years before you can see but, the impact of an action that took place today. Exactly. So do you believe that the reporting aspect of anything should not rely on um, the government, per se, or should it be an independent? Well, I think the government is the only entity that's in a position to coordinate and monitor at a system-wide level. I just think that we have to... Um, take all these factors into account when we determine what our indicators are and make people feel comfortable reporting what the true outcomes are and, and not feel like they should be held accountable for something that's not reasonable to hold them accountable for because it's too soon to measure the uh, outcome of their efforts. Right. Well, I would definitely think they're not because we rely on them for the, the statistics. So I, I hope that we can, um, you know, I hope that we can resolve that, that we would get accurate uh, reporting. And lastly, you said the no single, and I've heard this um, with earlier testimony, no single disease approach um, should be, and I, I thought that that may be a good idea because we hear so much about um, the cancer, the, um, uh, the um, HIV AIDS, um, diabetes, we're hearing that those stand out. Uh, so greatly in the district with growing numbers. So I'm wondering um, when you say we should not take that, and I understand your position on that, it may be a, it should be an overall approach and not a single. Well, I think approach. certainly if there's a particular issue that's overwhelming or outstanding at a particular point in time, it certainly warrants action. But I also think that there are commonalities across all of these different health conditions that by addressing why people don't utilize health care, by addressing why providers aren't culturally competent, by progressing why the community has health beliefs that are contrary to what they need to do for themselves. You would get more bang for your buck rather than just focusing on one disease. Thank you. And Council Member Grasso? I appreciate your testimony. I don't have any more questions, but thank you very much for adding your expertise on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And that completes our panel of public witnesses. Uh, I would ask that we take a five-minute recess, a ten-minute recess, uh, before we hear from our executive witness. Thank you.
Good afternoon. We are reconvening our hearing on the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2013, Bill 2572. And we will proceed with our executive witness, Ryan Springer, Senior Deputy Director, Community Health Administration, Department of Health. I just come right up, Mr. Springer. And anyone else who would like to join you? And gentlemen, if you don't mind, you can remain seated. If you don't mind raising your right hand, do you affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give the Committee on Health is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but? Thank you. And for the record, I just wanted to state um, my disappointment that uh, the director is not here. I understand Dr. Garcia is out of town. I have spoken with him. Uh, I respect you all highly um, for your positions and what you do, but for any hearing, I do expect the director of the agency uh, to be present. So in the future, um, we're going to ensure that that happens. But I do have a copy of your testimony, and you may proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Alexander and members of the Committee on Health. Community partners, fellow residents, and the District of Columbia. My name is Ryan Springer, and I'm the Senior Deputy Director of the Community Health Administration at the District of Columbia Department of Health. I'm pleased to present testimony on behalf of Dr. Joxel Garcia, Director of the Department of Health on Bill 2572, the Commission on Health Disparities Establishment Act of 2014. It is an honor to be here with you to discuss this legislation, which could have a long-lasting and positive impact on the health status of the residents of our city. In preparing for this hearing, the Department of Health worked closely with the District of Columbia Department of Disabilities. As you know, DDS provides innovative, high-quality services that enable people with disabilities to lead meaningful and productive lives as vital members of their families, schools, workplaces, and com communities. The DDS mission works in concert with the Community Health Administration's mission to improve health outcomes for targeted populations by promoting coordination within the healthcare system, enhancing access to prevention, medical care and support services, and fostering public participation in the design and implementation of programs. On behalf of Mayor Gray, both departments are pleased to jointly support the intent of the legislation before us today. At its core, the proposed legislation would establish a commission on health disparities with the purpose of examining health disparities in each ward and preparing comprehensive recommendations on what remedies are needed and where resources should be concentrated. My remarks will provide commentary on the intent of the legislation as well as recommendations that we feel would strengthen our collective ability to address and eliminate disparities, particularly in East of the River communities. First, we would like to specifically address the benefits that a Commission on Health Disparities could bring to the District of Columbia. Currently, chronic diseases account for six out of ten deaths in the district. <clears throat> with the first, second, third, fifth, and sixth leading causes of death attributable to heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and respiratory diseases, respectively. More alarmingly, the rate of chronic conditions and risk factors for chronic disease are much higher among African American residents than any other race. Working with Georgetown University Center for Excellence on Developmental Disabilities, the Developmental Disabilities Administration within DDS recently commissioned a study to quantify the outcomes of their health policy related to the promotion of prevention, preventive health screening. The data clearly demonstrates high rates of screening for major chronic conditions. Furthermore, the rate of hypertension screening, which holds particular significance for African Americans, is also very high. The study indicates the effectiveness of a system-wide approach to preventive screening and is an example of the importance of studying incidents of health disparities and creating and implementing an action plan to address those disparities. The Department of Health believes that the nonpartisan commission members, along with the inclusion of a disability expert, will be well suited to coordinate with district agencies, private organizations, and community groups to better understand the actual prevalence and impact of the various disparities before developing a comprehensive action plan to mitigate the severity of the many disparities that exist throughout the city. Another highlight of the proposed legislation is the requirement for a commission to analyze an unlimited number of health indicators. This is especially vital in the district where chronic diseases such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, childhood asthma, and diabetes are among the most prevalent, <clears throat> costly, and preventable of all health problems. In addition, African American residents are also disproportionately affected or impacted by HIV, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. In addressing disparities, the Department of Health is also seeking to address the high rates of syphilis among gay and bisexual men. 
Given the diverse and varied populations of the district's residents, both departments strongly agree that a comprehensive look at health disparities affecting all diseases, conditions, and health indicators is the best course of action. While both departments support the majority of the proposed language, we believe that the legislation would be strengthened by the inclusion of the term disability in Section 2, Subsection A, Clause 1. To that end, we recommend an amendment to the bill which would add a requirement for the Commission to examine health disparities as they relate to disability, and a corresponding amendment which would add a disability expert to the group of people from whom Commission members would be drawn. According to Healthy People 2020, an analysis of data 2010, which is the largest set of U.S. health data for people with disabilities, clearly reveals specific health disparities for people with disabilities as a whole. According to an article published just last month in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Axes of Access, research has confirmed that persons with physical disabilities confront barriers when attempting to access the healthcare system as a result of various physical, policy, procedural, and attitudinal barriers. For people with intellectual disabilities, the literature has found a cascade of disparities, including a high prevalence of adverse conditions, inadequate attention to care needs, inadequate focus on health promotion, and inadequate access to quality health care services, resulting in the overall poor health status of people with intellectual disabilities. Among the final recommendations is the need for, a commission, for the Commission to address the disproportionate impact of health disparities on minorities. Beyond chronic disease and, epi and epidemic rates, a recent survey on the children and youth within the special health care needs population revealed that there are racial and ethnic disparities in the special needs population within the district. Of note, African Americans comprise nearly 69% of the district's special needs population as opposed to nearly 19% of whites. Thus, similar to the approach implemented in neighboring jurisdictions, including all other Health and Human Services Region 3 jurisdictions, the Department of Health is currently collaborating with federal and community partners to explore the feasibility of creating an Office of Health Equity within the Department of Health. The office would promote minority health through coordination, support, and assessment of existing efforts to reduce and ultimately eliminate minority-specific health disparities through the, throughout the district. Thus, the Office of Health Equity would clearly mirror the intent of the legislation before us today. In conclusion, both Department of Health and the Department of Disability Services believe that the intent of the proposed legislation would move the district forward in its effort to address health disparities. Access to high quality and affordable preven prevention measures, including screening and appropriate follow-up, are essential steps in saving lives, reducing disability, and lowering costs for medical care. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your efforts in making the health and lives of district residents a priority. I am happy to respond to any questions at this time. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Springer. Just to highlight some of the points of your testimony, so if there is um, an office created, the Office of Health Equity. Uh, would that be, that would be within the Department of Health? or is yep. Yeah, the office has not been created as yet, but we're talking to our federal partners who oversee the Office of Minority Health nationally. And so we're looking at opportunities to create such an office within the district, within the Department of Health. So could the commission be incorporated um, in that office? And That is certainly a possibility. And this office would be eligible for separate funding? Or would it be through funding with um, the Department of Health? We're looking for external funding. And so, uh, along with local as well, but I'm looking at other models uh, for Office of Minority Health. And so, as I mentioned, in partnership with our federal partners, I know the Fe HHS offers uh, federal funding, and I think the cycle is every two years. We've missed the most recent cycle, where they've supported other states in setting up and forming an Office of Minority Health. Uh, so we'll be looking for other federal opportunities to support that work. We're currently looking at a prevention grant that does speak to some disparity issues, and so we're looking for opportunities to fund that, that, that work. Thank you. And in ter earlier testimony, I believe Dr. Alexander mentioned the inclusion of the disability community. So uh, thank you for that. We would definitely agree to add that provision. So I appreciate your, um, your testimony on that. And you mentioned another recommendation is to address the disproportionate impact of health disparities on minorities. Um, so there needs to be another emphasis, health disparities, do you think it is mainly among um, minorities or in addition to? So you're saying with all the other social factors to really focus on, do you see that, do you see that as the greatest disparity among different 
ethnic groups? It certainly is an important factor, but this is why we were looking at an Office of Health equity across the board, because we're looking at various populations, whether racial or otherwise. We want to look at the system as a whole to see what are the barriers to folks' access and care, what are the community uh, behavioral norms that impede folks to access care of their own volition. So we're looking at it across the board, and although I think the, the racial component certainly is a, a major factor, the data shows that, we've got Africa, the African-American population being uh, greatly impacted by most of these diseases, but I think it would be a disservice to only look at that and to look across health equity, uh, across the system in general. So what are some of the other, when we mention um, the social determinants, do you think we've covered everything in the legislation, or should there be other when I look at the community, um, the community health needs assessment, there are a lot of different um, organizations and agencies. Do you think that they should all be a part of the commission? Um, do you have any suggestions on any, um, I guess, amendments, aside what you said, the size of the commission, right. um, the number of social determinants? Would there be any additional recommendations? And if you would like me to go over those again for you? If you would. Sure. Um, the composition would include, um, and these are for specialists and in particular areas, um, we have social and human services, early learning and education, minority communities, economic development, ecology and environment. Um, would there be any other areas? I know you mentioned um, the LGBT. LGBT. Yep. Um, community. Yep. Disability, of course, is what we recommended the as disability. well. Disability. Um, and I, I certainly I would follow up with uh, the previous testimony from uh, the witnesses, re public witnesses, regarding the inclusion of peers. Um, looking at other models uh, from, you know, I come, coming from DBH and looking at the recovery model, it's very important to have individuals who have been through the issue at the table as well and having the community at the table and family members. Okay and community members. Yep. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering, are we, so that would cover, okay, the experts. And social determinants, I guess we could go over the list of those, but those are the, so I think we probably have covered um, everything. When we come to social and human services, that would, yep. um, that would encompass a large group of things. That when we talk about housing and um, income level, so that would that would focus on that. I was wondering about the um, the legislation calls for the mayor to appoint the chairman of the commission. Do you think that that is appropriate? I think it's a very viable option uh, with the commission. Um, and the number is it not? Well, we would have to add right. um, some additional members yeah. um, for that for the addition. Um, of the things that you recommended or that others have recommended. Do you think that there's a too large a group? Um, there's definitely a point where if the number gets too large, it's uh, more difficult to manage and actually have some input. And I, I fully agree with the previous testimony around we want this to be something that gets to action. And so hence why we were proposing and looking at this Office of Health Equity within DOH, uh, because we want to get to a point where we can take the great information that we currently have um, and turn that into strategically some action around impacting the community and, and looking for uh, tracking and measuring the, the health outcomes over time. As far as the chairperson of the commission is concerned, do you think that they need to be a separate entity or should they be affiliated um, with government? Well. And I think there, there are various ways to approach this. And this is one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to our federal partners to look at the options that other states are engaged in. Um, in my testimony, I mentioned that all of the states in Region 3 for HHS, they all have offices of minority health. And so I'm actually attending a conference in July with all of the state offices to look at best practices. Uh, for me, this is really about looking at the systems level. How do we take the best practices, policy, programming, and implement them at the systems level to make sure that our folks are accessing care? And as well, getting ahead in the community to make sure that we're re removing the barriers to folks on the behavioral side of so why they don't access. So I, I just want to ask you, for the Office on Minority Health, that model, do they just focus on different ethnic groups or do they focus on all the areas um, that we discuss, the disability community, the LGBT community, um, you know, do they focus on other 
factions of, of minority health? What do they focus on? My understanding is I think I'm sure it can be a varied approach depending on the state. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to going to this conference to see what the other models look like and how they're structured. But for us, we certainly, uh, given the testimony, we believe that disabilities and other areas should be involved in this as well. If we're looking at health equity, it's across the board for all of our citizens. And do you feel, who, who should be um, members of the commission? What expertise should they possess? Well, I think the list that we have currently uh, that you've proposed, I think that's a solid list, uh, and also adding those that we've recommended. But I think, of course, DOH would have to be involved in some form or fashion within community health administration. We cover all the chronic uh, diseases, cancer and chronic diseases, and I think it's a very important function that we have and, and would have to be involved in, in, in this process. And as far as the community members or the peers are concerned, yes. what would be the areas um, that we need to extract these members from? Are the disparities, is it um, wards 5, 7, and 8? Or would you say across the board there needs to be um, a, a peer member? And uh, honestly, again, there are various approaches to that because in looking at trying to maintain the numbers to be manageable, um, so I think we should look at probably the risk factors that we're addressing versus just the disease and see if we can find pairs that match up with some of the key risk factors that we're looking at um, and pull those to the table. Okay. And you mentioned, so we're clear on the legislation. You mentioned um, your recommendations. So as far as, aside from the recommendations that you gave, everything else um, the executive would be supportive of. Yes. Um, now, the community um, needs health assessment. And what I've noticed, and to be fair, I know that there is a new um, director now, but what I've noticed is that the, there is no um, change other than the director's name from 2013 to 2014 with all of the um, assessments that were given. So I'm wondering, is this done on an annual basis or you know, because things just shifted. And, and I'm going to be fair, because I know Dr. Levin is gone and now Dr. Garcia is there. But these are exactly the same. This is the same report as in 2013. How often is this report um, done? And, I, and I'm going to say all things being equal that the director is there, um, the same director is there. How often is this assessment completed? Well, I'm not sure what that looks like historically, but I can say from our perspective that we believe it's something that needs to be done on an annual basis and monitored and updated on an annual basis. Uh, for me, having access to the data is one of the most important things that we need to, to, to maintain and look at. Um, and then looking at monitoring that over time to see how well we're doing in moving the needle. And as one of the witnesses earlier mentioned, we're not going to see changes happen, you know, six months later or a year later, but at least if we build the infrastructure in place, we can see and monitor uh, the changes over time. So can you um, explain how this information was gathered? Um, what did you use? How did you gather the information? Surveys or did you go to doctors? What were the different groups that you, you obtained information um, from? Well, I would, How did you gather it? I can certainly pull that information for you. Um, I wasn't here during the time when this uh, report was, was crafted, but I can certainly pull some information on, on who were the stakeholders that were involved in this process. Um, would you be familiar with the process of the yeah. assessment? Sure. So this particular one was done by the Department of Health, and it was taken. And if you could identify. Yeah, sure. I'm Saj Pope, at the Deputy Director of Operations. Um, I was here just prior to Ryan. So the... Uh, there are two points. One, just to get back to your last question, there are several community health needs assessments that are done um, on a regular basis. For example, Title V Maternal Child Health Block Grant is federally mandated to be done every five years. The next one is scheduled for this upcoming year, and actually we're in the midst now of implementing the same process that we utilized for the community health one. Um, that includes um, interviews, survey focus groups, um, direct, and we, we try to take a wide panel from all wards. Uh, we look at primary care physicians, we talk to um, subject matter experts, and then we also provide the data. The data comes from the Center for Policy planning evaluation within the Department of Health, and we um, secure that data from all of our partners in the community, including the hospitals. So it comes from that one division. How many persons work on that assessment? Is someone solely um, 
assigned to working on this? Right. That, that I'm not sure. Um, we can come, come, come back to you on that. Okay. I think an important point to follow up is that with these various assessments that we have, the intent going forward um, uh, under uh, under Chad's leadership now, we're going to take a look at all of these assessments and start looking at our strategic plan for action going forward. Because having the information now is great, but now we need to look at strategically how do we respond to the community needs that have been identified. Well, that was and that's my our next plan question. In the next, yes. <laughs> that was actually my next question. As a result of the assessment, what do we do with the information? Right. And, and CHA overall, Community Health Administration, we're going over, we will be going through a full strategic planning process over the next couple of months. That's our intent. And from that, we want to utilize the work that has been done already, uh, looking at the, the needs and identify strategically what are we going to be responding to, where the highest needs are, and what. And, and so you're going to use this current Absolutely. information. Absolutely. That along with the other uh, need assessments that we have as well. Yeah. And a great example of that is within the Title V Maternal Child Health Block Grant assessment, it was determined five years ago that lead poisoning was among one of the bigger concerns for our special health care needs populations. And this most recent assessment is indicating it's, not, it's no longer one of our top ten. And so we can now reallocate funds toward other areas of improvement. I wanted to put on the radar, someone brought it to my attention um, just yesterday about hepatitis C actually growing um, uh, really growing in numbers greater than HIV AIDS uh, in the District of Columbia and was wondering I know and it, it was also brought to my attention that there is a actual cure um, for that particular disease but the medication is currently um, not covered it's, under it's, Medicaid. It's a thousand dollars a pill. Which, yeah. Are, are we working on that or is anyone working in conjunction with healthcare finance um, to get that covered. Yeah, so HASTA, um, or HIV Administration, is currently working on an initiative, and I think they're partnering uh, with our regional partners in Maryland as well to look at some funding to support the hep Hepatitis C initiative. So would that be federal funding available um, for that too? That um, goes to HASTA? And right. So um, the HIV AIDS Hepatitis STD Tuberculosis Administration works uh, strictly with the HRSA on title, um, what they call Brian White funding, and I believe we had an earlier testimony from that. The Planning Council works on allocating funds to a program called the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, ADAP. Um, their current plan right now is to utilize savings through the Affordable Care Act that move patients off ADAP onto Medicaid enrollment and utilize that savings toward the purchase of these drugs for hepatitis C patients who also have HIV. For those patients who have hepatitis C and don't have HIV, we're currently in the midst of seeking funding. So in terms of the current assessment, um, has there been any work done in terms of tracking um, the different diseases to measure any progress in the District of Columbia? Has there been any any value to this assessment up to this point? Or you mentioned you're going to plan a report in the upcoming months. Has there been anything done with this in terms of tracking from, I guess, from yeah. 2012 to 2013? Yep. Any improvements? If I'm not mistaken as well, DOH is also looking at a, a report card based as a follow-up to this, this, uh, this document, this assessment. And they're looking at uh, disparity ratios, risk ratios, uh, for each ward. And so I think that will also then give us a better idea of which wards are experiencing disparities around what, uh, what uh, disease. Um, and as we're doing our strategic planning, it speaks to the work and the focus of which, uh, which ward we go into uh, first. So, for example, I know D.C. Appleseed, I believe, came up with that report um, with HIV, HIV AIDS. Did they use any of the information provided in this assessment? They did. Yes, they did. They did? They also interviewed as well the team that put this together. Okay. Now, it was mentioned that the, well, in earlier testimony, we had two um, physicians mm -hmm. who testified, and they were mentioning about holding um, providers accountable uh, as well when, when persons don't go to the doctor. That was mentioned that that's, a, that, that's really one of the common causes of um, later stage diagnosis and the doctors have to play a role in terms of accountability with their patients. What can the Board of Medicine, what role um, can they play in terms of providing doctors reports to show them um, where they are um, with regards to District of Columbia residents? 
I think it goes back to two things. One, uh, making sure that we do have the capacity to collect, track, and monitor all of the data coming from the hospitals, the hospitals and our community partners. Um, and then two, you know, and we'll take a look at the other states and how they're responding to this as well. But not just providing that data back to the doctors, but then there's a lot of training and education and TA that needs to be provided to make sure that they're operating in a culturally competent kind of manner. And, you know, we've talked and we've heard from the various witnesses, there's so many different components that play into these disparity issues. And I think this is why, you know, I commend uh, you and the council for putting this on the table because we do have to look at what does it look like across the spectrum. There are functions that I think at the provider level, they can do better as well for some of them. Uh, but also we need to look at individuals in the community and what are the cultural norms that, you know, that prevent folks from seeking care. Uh, as mentioned, we have over 95% coverage in the city, but then folks are still not utilizing that care. One example is looking at our infant mortality program uh, that DOH and CHA is involved in. And we know that this is also an area of, of disparity uh, for the women in our program. And we're taking a very close look at that, that project and that through this program to, to reduce that disparity. And we're trying to have a real definitive impact in that over the next year or so. Now, we don't want to be duplicative with our our work from the commission um, to this community needs assessment. And I want to know what is going to be the marked difference or what do you think needs to happen with the commission um, aside from the work that Department of Health is already doing? Yeah. What, what will the commission do to go a step further? Um, and I can speak to my initial thinking when we proposed this Office of Health Equity. And part of it was Again, collecting the information is great, so we have some information, some new assessment, which is good. Um, and so for next steps, we're looking at what are the programmatic needs strategically that we need to get involved in. And so having recommendations around, okay, strategically we need to impact these particular risk factors given the current progr programming that we're involved in what we need to get involved in, but then also looking at what are the policy implications, how can we impact policy in a way uh, that also assist in this. One example from uh, one of the other states, Washington State, from their Office of Minority Health, they are working on or actually have in place a process where they look at health in all policies. And so any new bill that's being proposed, you can request this Office of Minority Health uh, for them to review it and give uh, a health impact uh, around disparities. And I think those are functions that I think uh, would have to come out of some entity, whatever this entity looks like. Um, those are all options. But again, I'm looking forward to going and seeing what the other states are doing so we can pull together a, a full cadre of, of tools. But the commission definite, definitely needs to um, have access to this assessment. Absolutely. Currently, who have you, who, who is this um, distributed to? It's actually widely distributed. We have it on our website right now. If you go to doh.gov, our yeah, .gov, .dc .gov. Um, and then we also um, disseminate it to those partners who are, we have often community meetings inside. Um, you know, anyone who asks for it, obviously, and I think we will try and do a better job of promoting its access accessibility. Um, but we're trying to do, move away from paper printing as much as possible for the council's recommendation. And, and I'm sure the concern is that, you know, we have all of these reports and many documents and they don't get utilized. But as I mentioned, it's widely distributed. But I think, too, as we're getting into our strategic planning, one of, the, one of our duties is to translate this information into something meaningful for the community. And so as we're strategically, you know, uh, looking at our programming in different wards, looking at the risk factors and engaging those communities, we can use this information from this needs assessment and others, translate that in a manner that makes sense for the community, the family, for providers. And it all looks different depending on who we're targeting and who the audience is. Uh, there was a concern, and I know a lot of the district agencies, everyone has a report card, you have a grading system. Um, there was earlier testimony that expressed concern that um, when we have reporting from government agencies, sometimes people are fearful that their job may be on the line if we um, allocate money or if we have a benchmark to lower rates of, you know, diabetes by whatever, you know, if there's a goal that they are afraid that um, sometimes the numbers may be skewed because their jobs may be on the line. Um, what would be your recommendation um, that we would have accurate reporting? I'm confident that we do um, have accurate reporting, but um, how would you address that um, concern that people are worried about whether these statistics, these numbers are real based on, you know, job effectiveness? 
would like to, to uh, you know, ease any concerns at all. The, the data is accurate. And so, and the thing is, we're held accountable by many different parties, uh, from council to our federal grant, uh, grantors. And so we have many different checks and balances in the system and in the process to ensure that we're providing correct data and that we're working with our uh, grantees to make sure that they're giving us accurate data. Um, but as far as the, the original comment, I think honestly it, it comes down to a managerial and leadership style, to be, to be very frank, because I think there's value in looking at the quality outcomes from the programming that we're doing, and that's one track, but then if I'm looking at the, uh, the, you know, the performance of my staff, that's a different conversation. And so I think, although the two are linked, the performance measures of my staff's ability to do their job and the quality of the outcomes I'm seeing uh, from our programming, it's, it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation. And so that's something that I, I would manage internally in terms of what I'm holding my staff accountable for. But I truly believe that with the mission and vision that we are creating for the administration, that our staff are highly self-motivated um, and they want to provide the best and do the best. You know, it's just, it's kind of a tough thing to measure because when we allocate um, funding towards different initiatives, we do want to see results with that. Yep. If, you know, I put a million dollars towards chronic illnesses and, and you know, the instances go up, mm -hmm. we're going to question, well, what happened um, with that, you know, with those funds that were spent? You know, what, what did we do? And that's a great point because I think it comes down to capacity as well. You know, we have uh, various pockets of funding, whether uh, federal funded or otherwise, uh, to address particular needs, but the scope of the need might be a lot greater than the actual funding that we currently have. And so I think through the strategic process, we're trying to look at that as well to make sure that we are putting our money and resources in the right place given the scope of the need. Um, and, and I'll go back to data as always. I think we've got to be in a place where I can have my hands on all of the data from our partners, from the community and internally that gives me that 30,000 foot view of what's happening in the district. That then can drive uh, in a much more strategic way the directions that we go. And we talk about the social determinants of health, and I think they are very important. The legislation calls for collaboration across different city agencies. Mm -hmm. I want to know um, from you, um, either of you, if you could suggest some agencies. I know I'm really going to look into this, but yep. what agencies do you feel um, firsthand need to be involved in this effort? Well, we can certainly follow up with a more in-depth list, but off the top of my head, I mean, of course, having uh, the school system involved, um, Department of Behavioral Health, um, DDS, of course, as a, as a partner who's already here and supporting the effort, uh, Aussie. So I think some of the key players and, and their, current, their current opportunities for that conversation to happen as some of us are already sitting on various work groups, uh, but I think having those partners at the table will be critical. And um, the last question, it was um, debated whether we need to focus on the disease. I mean, we, we focus on, there were three um, high instances in the District of Columbia of diseases that stand out. And it was argued that some people think that we should focus to see measurable results to just tackle um, the particular disease and lower the instances. And some people are saying it should be an overall approach to tackle the individuals affected no matter uh, what the disease may be. Yeah. Uh, what do you think would be the best approach to address disparities? Because I mean, it was listed that disparities are happening in particular areas, but they're also happening in particular sectors of our city and particular individuals. So what would be the best approach that we could measure results across the board? And so I, th I think, um, you know, for the Community Health Administration, we certainly can't just pick two or three of the factors and focus on it. So our approach, or my approach going forward, is really looking at the prioritizing. And I do believe, and I think it was mentioned by one of the previous witnesses, is looking at the risk factors that impact the majority of these diseases across the board. And I think we've got the same core issues that impact a majority of these. Obesity um, and is, is one to look at. And so I think if you look at, if you look at it from that approach, 
Um, my expectation is that we will focus on how do we impact and improve the system to make sure that we can, you know, reduce those risk factors for individuals and get them into care earlier. So I, th I do believe it's not just about the disease and picking one or two, but looking at the risk factors across the board. And what are the commonalities in the risk factors that we can have a, a direct impact? I think we get a bigger bang for our buck in that regard, and we impact a larger portion of the population um, in improving their health. Why, thank you. That concludes um, my questions uh, for you. That concludes today's hearing. I truly would like to thank everyone who came to testify today. I look forward to um, actually marking up this legislation and so we can get to the real work um, of the mission of this legislation. Uh, the time is approximately... Uh, 3.45 p.m. As a matter of record, I would like to note that this will close on June 13th at 5.30 p.m. And we are adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you.